The pandemic also highlights the risks of bioterrorist attacks and has already shown some of the ways in which preparedness might fall short if a disease were to be deliberately manipulated to be more virulent or intentionally released in multiple places at once. And welcome to the second day of Unidius Innovation Summit 2020. My name is Giacomo Persipaoli, and uh, I am the program lead for security and technology at Unidir. Yesterday, during the first day of uh, our event, we've learned how new technologies and new processes and new actors are really reshaping the way in which life sciences is conducted. We started with a, a panel on gene editing and CRISPR. And then in the second panel, we've learned how new processes are really uh, starting to reshape the world, like the inclusion of cloud labs and new actors with the introduction of the DOI bio community are really entering this game. Today, we'll continue this technological uh, journey looking at uh, nanobiotechnologies for delivery. And then we're going to switch to the second part of the conference, which is going to be focusing more on the governance and policy related issues. So without further ado, I would now launch a short video clip to introduce our next panel and we'll make a start. So thank you again uh, for joining us and uh, look forward to another successful um, conference. Thank you very much, Giacomo, and welcome everybody to this fascinating session where I'm hoping we can really address some of the so what questions for policymakers, but also the when we figure out so what, what we do next. I'm Kobe Lyons. I've recently completed my PhD on the international law that is applicable to the use of nanomaterials during armed conflict. And with me today, we have the privilege of two amazing presenters. We have Professor Zhang who works at the Institute of Biophysics Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Zhang. We uh, also need to mention that in his spare time, Professor Zhang likes to play Chinese music on the accordion. For more details about each of our presenters, you can see uh, a lot more de detailed information in the actual brochure that is attached to this event. We also have the incredibly incredible privilege of having Dr Friedrichs, who obtained her PhD at Oxford in 2002 and is a leading expert and policy advisor for emerging technological in innovation. An interesting fun fact about Steph, Dr Friedrichs, or Steffi if I may, is that she's driven a racing car around India to help raise money for teenage patients with cancer. So without further ado, I would like to hand over, thank both of you, first of all, for coming to this panel, which I think will be a really interesting and engaging panel. And Professor Zhang, if you would like to start with your presentation, which I understand will frame some of the science and the most recent advances from your perspective and with your incredibly broad expertise. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kobe. Uh, so, yes, it's my great pleasure to attend this conference. 
And I would like to present some of uh, uh, the uh, principle and uh, applications of uh, nanobiotechnology. So good afternoon, uh, good morning, <laughs> everyone. Um, the, uh, probably as you know, the origins of nanotechnology can be traced back to an early lecture at Caltech, the Nobel laureate Richard Feynman put forward a problem that was extremely challenging at the time. Why cannot we write the entire 24 volume of Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of the pin? To achieve that goal, it is necessary to reduce the size of the writing tool by 25,000 times. But let's consider all the books in the world. There are some 24 million volumes of interest in the world. For each bit, we allow 100 atoms. It turns out that all the information that man has carefully accumulated in all the books in the world can be written in this form in a cube, in a cube of a material one, uh, two hundredths hundred of an inch wide. So good afternoon, uh, good morning, <laughs> everyone. Um, the, uh, probably as you know, the origins of nanotechnology can be traced back to an early lecture at Caltech. The Nobel laureate Richard Feynman put forward a problem that was extremely challenging at the time. Why cannot we write the entire 24 volume of Encyclopedia uh, Britannica on the head of the pin? To achieve that goal, it is necessary to reduce the size of the writing tool by 25,000 times. But let's consider all the books in the world. There are some 24 million volumes of interest in the world. For each bit, we allow 100 atoms. It turns out that all the information that man has carefully accumulated in all the books in the world can be written in this form in a cube, in a cube of a material one, uh, two hundredths, hundredths of an inch wide. So as shown in, this, uh, in the figure uh, below, uh, scientists found that uh, at the scale of uh, one to 100 nanometers, uh, um, uh, macrophysics and uh, microphysics intersect to produce so-called nano effect in this region. At this scale, um, uh, uh, we could see the uh, the, uh, the the uh, the atoms. The uh, uh, single molecules and the viral particles, uh, and so, etc. So atoms uh, on a small scale behave like nothing on a large scale, for they satisfy the laws of the quantum me mechanics. We have new kinds of forces and new kinds of poss possibilities, new kinds of effects. And the problem of manufacture and uh, reproduction of the material will be quite different. So then we turn to the biological cells. They can be uh, exceedingly small, but they do all kinds of uh, marvelous things, which starts with what we want to do. So the question, challenging uh, generations and uh, spawn an uh, emerging field nanotechnology. So after several generations, we have come to the conclusion that there are many three kinds of physical laws at nanoscale, include uh, surface effects, which relate to chemical activity, and small size effects, and quantum size effect, and tunnel effects, which are related to new phenomena of optical you are the uh, the new properties of optics, uh, electronics, and magnetics, and so on. Um, so, uh, so under the control of these physics laws, uh, nanoscale matter re uh, presents uh, various marvelous properties. I'm not going to de 
to cope with care of these properties. Properties. So in last uh, in the past twenty years, these properties properties have been widely used. Um, for example, materials such as uh, uh, carbon nanotubes and uh, uh, graphene uh, devices like uh, chips. Right now, you know the uh, the, uh, the they are the they are five nanometer uh, the seven nanometer uh, five nanometer chips uh, almost in the market. So that the, the chips that uh, that lead to the development of the micro nano electronics electronic industry. So as well as the nano medicine and the nanobiology and the nano biotechnology. As uh, Feynman pointed out, the cell do all kinds of marvelous things, which which does we want to do. Uh, so I summarize the characteristics of the cell factory in the article. A cell is a perfect uh, nano factory full of uh, biological nano machines. It is a masterpiece of nature design. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are quite a number of uh, uh, features, for example, self assembly, because of the nano machines in, in cells maintain of uh, life process. Uh, all these nano machines were formed by, uh, by self assembly, the high specificity and high efficiency. So, the turnover number of biological nano machines is much higher than the chemical catalysts. And a high fidelity is very important. For example, DNA replication. Um, its fidelity determines the stability of our genome. They are about they are at least the three defense lines to prevent error, errors during DNA replication. So uh, through this molecular mechanism, the probability of a newly synthesized DNA containing the wrong base is very, very little. Yes. So, and a chemical, the energy, the, the energy for a cell comes from food and is stored in the form of ATP that comes the universal, that becomes the universal, universal uh, energy currency for all kinds of life systems. And so on. So um, uh, when we mentioned about the uh, uh, bio nano uh, components, there are two kinds. Uh, one is nature, one is uh, natural. For example, this part, one is natural. The other one is artificial. Uh, here are just it's just some examples for uh, the. Um, uh, the capsid of many viral viral uh, viral particles self example self example into a regular uh, uh, eicosahedron, the most multi phase regular polyhedron in nature, according to Euler's law. We use it to example various uh, the uh, the nanoparticles. For, for viral tracking in cells and for drug delivery. Um, so this is a this is a nano uh, channel, nano motor channels on the virus, which drive and control the passage of being the, the viral genome uh, uh, from the shell to uh, to outside the shell to the cell, and the other control the other biological molecules. The trans, uh, trans, uh, penetration of other biological molecules. And this is a bacterial flagellate, a multiple protein uh, machine embedded in the cell wall to drive the directional movement of cell, of the bacterial cell. And um, so similar molecular models are used by our cells to produce ATP molecules. The work was uh, granted as a Nobel Prize. And these are uh, nano building blocks uh, made of DNA molecules using the principle of DNA double strand complementation. And they are ideal nano building blocks with atomic precision for design and construction of a variety of nanobiological devices. 
So these are nano wires and nano uh, two-dimensional uh, monolayer arrays constructed using viral and bacterial elements, which can be used to develop a high sensitive, sensitive uh, biosensors and uh, nano devices. And the uh, merge of uh, nanotechnology and uh, nano, uh, the uh, nanobiology and nanoscience has given birth of formation and development of nanobiotechnology. So just last month, as a guest editor, I organized a special topic on nanobiology in this scientific journal and wrote a preface to it, the nanobiology symphony of bioscience and nanoscience in which I made the definition of nanobiology and nanobiotechnology. Several well-known scholars show their latest research progress in molecular, molecular uh, model, model uh, the, 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 the taste uh, and all the sensors and DNA frame work, uh, just like uh, uh, origami and uh, the uh, 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 biological effect of nanomaterials in brain and the uh, biomimic uh, nano devices. So um, <clears throat> then, uh, although uh, it is uh, emerging field, nanobiotechnology has already demonstrated its broad uh, application prospects especially the enhancement of existing technology. Here are some examples. So the uh, sensitivity of biosensors has been, the sensitivity of biosensors has been greatly improved by using nanotechnology. The combined uh, uh, flexible electronics, various wearable uh, enzyme sensors have been reported. And the bio pro nanoprobes and uh, molecular biosensors have been widely used in detection of the biological reactions in living cells, so making this biological process visible. Um, highly density, uh, high density biochips are powerful tools to monitor the, uh, the gene expression and use uh, uh, the screening of the drugs in a way of high throughput. A combine of stem cell technology, scientists now are able to create, create the human organs on a chip for preclinical drug evaluation, which will greatly reduce the risk of clinical drug, uh, drug trial of failure. And nano drugs, of course, is a very good example. Has very uh, some advantages over their traditional dosage form. They have good bio combat compatibility, reduce the toxicity, and they can uh, better uh, target the tumor uh, microenvironment and realize the sustained release, control the release of drug and so on. So just uh, in short summary, as highly interdisciplinary uh, uh, dis, uh, dis, discipline, now uh, biotechnology has uh, uh, extensive uh, influence on, for example, uh, promoting the uh, interdisciplinary development of life science with chemistry physics, material, information sciences, uh, as well as uh, 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 the, uh, the uh, engineering uh, science. They solve many basic scientific problems. Uh, for uh, formulating uh, nano industry, or upgrades the, uh, the upgrading the uh, traditional industry to create new opportunities for economic, uh, economic growth. And uh, advancing technologies in medicine, environmental protection, and agriculture to contribute to human well-being. So due to these reasons, the develop, developed economy 
economists have adopted the uh, nanobiotechnology as the important part of their nanotechnology research plans, and China does the same. So, implication to armament, uh, the topic of this conference. So, as an enabling technology, nanobiotechnology may also enhance existing armament, such as attack, defense, and uh, human enhancement. Because I'm not expert in this uh, regard, please refer to uh, Dr. Stevens' presentation. Uh, uh, so, uh, in conclusion, emerging from here, technologies are often uh, uh, double uh, uh, sword. The, um, the whole world should reach the reach the uh, uh, and a consensus to talk. To promote the development and a peaceful use of nanobiotechnology under the framework of ethics and international rules. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, you. Professor Zhang. That was really a really lovely framing of what we are going to talk about next. Uh, and I think really interesting way to look at all the possibilities of what advances in nanomaterials are currently presenting for us. We can hand over to Dr. Dr. Friedrichs to talk a little bit about the risks, but also her expertise. As I understand, you have a lot of expertise in regulating nanomaterials in a slightly different context. Thanks, Dr. Friedrichs. Good. Good morning, everybody. And while I'm getting ready, um, uh, let me just um, admit to you that I've just learned that next time I do something like this, I will set up in front of my library as well. I'm currently joining you from my bedroom, which is clearly not the, uh, the given standard for this one. Um, um, but I'm even more thrilled to be able to tell you uh, about what I have found to be representable potential applications of this. Um, uh, so you will appreciate that the difficulty in all of this is that um, uh, there's no publications about what is really used in defense or in, uh, in, in weaponry. Um, so what we have to go by is the best appreciation of what is possible in terms of science and what we can then probably um, extrapolate to saying, if it is possible, it can probably be implemented in an area that is very well funded, as well funded as that of weaponry and, uh, and arms. And defense as well, that is to be mentioned as well. So I'm going to uh, giving you just a little, um, why the heck? Ah, here we go, let us slightly late. So giving you just a little brush over of what I want to absolutely hammer home to begin with, it's we're not talking about a new technology that all of a sudden allows you to create new weapons that have never been there before. We are talking about a technology that is an enabling technology. And to understand a little bit better why I'm, why I'm pointing that out is nanotechnology is in essence nothing else than just the technology that we can apply on a certain length scale. Nano just means 10 to the power of minus nine. And it is uh, usually used in order to refer to um, the inorganic uh, technology we are, so non-biological, non-living technology we are conducting at that length scale. And if we then combine that with the biotechnology, um, that obviously means we can now use inorganic technology down on that length scale and we can um, uh, tweak life um, uh, and living matter and biology um, uh, where it really happens. You had a very good presentation yesterday by Andrew Hessel who said, uh, in essence, it's all about coding and the, uh, the digital code, although it has a few more letters than just noughts and ones um, uh, in biology is in essence what drives biology as well. But what we are delivering here is to be applying this coding really to matter because it, it won't exist for us if it doesn't um, uh, exist in the material world. And that is what we are doing here. And out of that comes what we are calling nanobiotechnology or bio nanotechnology. Don't let anybody drag you into the semantics between the one and the other. Both of those mean that we're applying the largely inorganic technology that is nanotechnology to the field of living matter. 
So in essence, we are not saying anything else than nanotechnology or nanobiotechnology is an enabling technology at the interface of 10 to minus nine meters, um, uh, 10 to the power of minus nine meters, essentially where biological processes and all processes happen. Um, and what it gives us is we now have a form of applying our engineering inorganic knowledge to biology. And um, uh, for those of you that would basically mean, well, it doesn't mean anything else than uh, genetic modification and, and genetic um, uh, um, um, uh, manipulation in the first place, to a large extent that is true. It means we now have the tools that are fine enough in order to to work with living matter, but nanobiotechnology pushes it a little bit further in that we're actually using inorganic nanotechnological matter in the process as well. So what I would like to do now is I'd just like to give you a few examples of what we actually mean. Um, um, and for some reason, I really am not getting anywhere with advancing my slides here. Yeah. Now we go. Um, uh, what we actually have available, um, uh, as was just very well introduced by my previous presenter, Professor Zhang, um, we are talking about roughly three different areas, whereas the one that we are really interested in today, and now I have Kobe sitting in front of my slides here. Hang on, I need to push you up a little bit. Um, um, so we are really talking about um, the use of nanobiotechnology in attack weapons. We are, but for everything that is a potential attack weapon, the, the attack of one is the defense of another. We are also using similar technology in order um, uh, to defend whatever needs to be defended in that context. So we're talking about we can use nanorobots, we can use um, uh, delivery of certain agents into the body, as has just been mentioned as well. The nanoscale drugs using nanoparticles as a delivery directly into the cell and thereby cutting down the systemic side effects is certainly one thing that um, uh, is totally loved by the pharmaceutical industry. But it will obviously, as with any technology, have its application in dual use as well. So you can, depending on what drug you're loading onto the surface of a nanoparticle and transporting into a cell, you can make an attack weapon out of it. You can use the same concept in defense by using nanotechnology to detect chemical agents, to detect biological agents, to even do nuclear detection and um, uh, you can even do nanomedicine, so you can you can treat any effect that uh, soldiers might have had on the battlefield. Um, uh, not necessarily only from nano, but from everything else as well. Um, a large area of this, I will give you an example of that, has to do with the fact that everything is so small now that we can do everything together. And that is good. You don't need four different sensors for the four different applications I'm showing you here. You can essentially do everything in one go. And then the largest field, which is really more to the point what we're discussing here today, is the biological interface of the nano and the bio part. And that would be um, what I understand or would call human enhancement, biological enhancement or enhancement of, of humans in that context. That sounds like an already weighted um, uh, um, terminology, but I, I want to come away from saying that is bad or good because obviously there is a, a very big gray zone between what is an enhancement and what is um, uh, a cure of a disease or what can actually help to live with disabilities. For some people who might, might call it a disease, um, uh, some people even define aging as a disease and, uh, and in that case, um, uh, uh, people who want to live forever, any of these cryo um, uh, research at the moment is seen as a disease prevention as opposed to any enhancement of the body. So huge gray zone there. But what I would like you to understand from this slide is we have an external part of that. So anything that works external to the body, but that helps the human um, uh, soldier in the field to react better, to be better alert and to, to have better senses. And then there is an internal one where one can actually use nanotechnology to insert something into the body um, uh, where one can um, uh, deliver through nanobiotechnology um, uh, things that were just shown in the previous presentation to enhance the human from within. And then the biggest um, uh, area is connecting those two. Um, uh, using the technology we have on the battlefield external to the soldier, the machine he needs to pick up currently and maybe strap on, connecting that directly to um, uh, the nervous system of the soldier. And that is where we are then connecting the invasive part with the 
with the external part. And we already in, in medicine, in uh, civil application, have uh, uh, shown some examples where the brain can be directly connected to a muscle and people can be taught to control artificial limbs for that. So I think what you're really after is some more pictures than me just talking or seeing words on the screen. And uh, I really don't know what triggers my slides, but um, uh, I will keep trying. Here we go. So just a very quick um, um, background of why is it relevant that we're talking about. We're talking about huge amounts of money. And if you look at this slide, I only had the nanotechnology. This is not nanobiotechnology. This is only inorganic nanotechnology, although how much of that is applied to the biological interface, one really doesn't know from these numbers. And I only have them available from the US. This is R&D spending. Um, uh, 2006 versus 2020, and admittedly, you can see that um, uh, even here the spending has uh, has decreased a little bit. But that is a very recent thing only. It is now mainly done in environmental applications, the R and D of nanotechnology, and in medical applications. So relatively, it has decreased, but we are still talking about a significant chunk of money that has flown ever since the National Nanotechnology Initiative in the US was launched in 2006. This amount of money has flown largely into defense. And then there's obviously a civil application in any of the other fields that come with a dual use potential. Um, uh, one of the, just as a, as a by the by and as an anecdotal evidence, one of the um, uh, most popular stories at the time in 2006 for this large 31.4% defense spending on nanotechnology was the um, uh, nanotechnology soldier. That was basically the guy who was more than the, than the $6 million man. Was it $6 million? Anyway, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, he will have fallen foul of inflation anyway by now. But um, uh, we, um, more than that, this would have been a soldier with both external um, uh, so um, armor that is external to the body, but also internal connectivity um, uh, and, and internal bone structure that would have made this uh, person a super, uh, a super human being. And therefore, a super weapon in the battlefield as well. So looking at some applications, what is possible? Um, we did talk about some really small drones, and when we are saying nanotech, we mean really, really, really small. You essentially have to imagine that through nanotechnology, anything that we know as a big application, we can now make really, really small. And here you have an example, um, uh, which I've pulled off the web for you in order to show you what this really looks like. This is essentially a very small fly. You can see the amazing thing is the biomimicry here by which people are really using um, uh, the nature, the example by nature, um, uh, and are making the objects on the small scale exactly like they find them. Because there is a reason why nature has made a fly the way that it has made a fly. There is something about uh, aerodynamics that really make this thing fly much better than if this thing was looking like a helicopter. So this looks like a little bit like a mosquito, but it is in essence an inorganic structure with its own power source, with its own processor and camera. And uh, to give you a little bit more of an overview of what this would essentially look like and what the components are, you can see all of these are essentially components that are already known to us. This is engineering on the large scale, just done very, very, very small. And that is what nanotechnology is enabling. So this was, would be an example of, um, uh, of monitoring, of surveillance, or maybe even depending on what that drone carries, um, uh, it could be an attack weapon as well. And uh, I've added to the slide, because that will be available um, uh, to you, I've added some real uh, examples of what is currently done. We are looking at some of these vehicles really being built, and not too few of them actually in military and, and aerospace research. And then there is the example of response to that one, what I mentioned earlier, the defense. Putting a number of different sensors all onto the same device is really what nanotechnology enables us. Yes, we probably have a sensor or we can quickly build a sensor for any chemical weapon or any biological weapon you are deploying in the field. But if you have to build a special sensor and you have to carry it with you, that is really going to be a problem. The hype is really in making something as small as you can see it on the left. 
and putting it all onto a, a simple um, uh, sensor that gives you an immediate readout and that gives you an immediate warning. You don't have to carry that. It can even be fixed somewhere on the body. It can be fixed somewhere on the on the external armor. And that is really what Nano makes um, uh, um, available to us. And as you can see here, we have, um, uh, um, it's called multiplexing the whole um, uh, thing. Does. We, we, um, we are currently counting up here the multiplexing mainly of uh, physical properties, that is optic, uh, optical, electrochemical, magnetic, and mechanical. But you heard in the previous presentation, we can easily um, uh, also extend that to censoring of biological weapons and, and other biological interfaces. And then we have an example of the non-invasive human enhancement or biological enhancement in general, and that would be um, uh, wearing something um, all the time. You don't even notice it anymore. Many of us wear contact lenses. We don't even notice we are putting them on in the morning anymore. Um, uh, and that would allow us a display on the eye to be fed with um, uh, digital information. And in the context of uh, soldiers in the field, that could have to do with targeting. That could be information, maybe even linked to your sensor. Um, uh, um, is there a, uh, a certain chemical um, present in the in the field around you? Has it just been released that you need to be careful about it? So all of that can be essentially given to the soldier. There are already models that are used where the soldier has to put on some really large goggles, putting all of that into a single contact lens which you can't lose, which can't be knocked off your head, um, uh, is the next advancement. And as you can see, we are really quite far ahead with that one. And then we are coming to the invasive human advancement. And here is um, uh, an example where I've chosen a, a mouse model in order to show you what is really possible with those nanoparticles you just saw in the previous um, presentation. And that is essentially an in vivo imaging of where do the nanoparticles go. You heard that we can use nanoparticles to deliver specific drugs that are loaded on the outside of a nanoparticle directly into specific cells of the body, cutting down on the systemic side effects. Great news for the pharmaceutical industry, even passing directly through the blood brain barrier because a particle can be transported a lot more easily than, than a virus can, for example. Um, uh, but we can also use the cavity inside some of the very famous um, uh, um, buckyballs and carbon-16 fullerenes. So we can not only coat it on the outside, we can even use these famous C60 molecules in order to transport something on the inside. And that would be an example of targeting the very cell where it needs to go into, targeting the very neuron it needs to attach to, and delivering an enhancement drug, a stimulus directly where it needs to go. And now, now comes the very um, uh, interesting part of invasive to non-invasive enhancement. So here is what I mentioned earlier, the, um, uh, the linking of the, um, sorry, the linking, and now it works too fast, the linking of, uh, of um, um, the marrow bone um, uh, directly um, to the, um, in the residual limb, limb directly to the artificial limb. Um, uh, this is a gentleman who can essentially use his thoughts, which control his usual functioning part of the body and would then control his muscles and they are then attached to the artificial limb. What nanotechnology does here is that it can actually create an interface at a very, very small scale where an individual muscle needs to be linked to a cable or a wire in the artificial limb. Without nanotech, that wouldn't have been possible. But we're always talking about, uh, about a biological nano interface, hence nanobiotechnology. And the other one is a direct brain implant. The one thing that we achieved recently in research is we can make cells grow and live on silicon chips. We know what the interface needs to look like. So if we now learn to translate the nodes and, Z, the nodes and ones that we use in our digital world and programming to the DNA programming of the body, essentially the whole world is ours. Um, uh, that may be a scare story to some, but in, in the case of this lady, who is a quadriplegic um, uh, and who had a brain implant allowing her to move a, uh, an artificial arm 
and even fly the simulation of a fighter jet um, uh, just with her thoughts. Um, that is a huge um, uh, breakthrough for the technology for treating um, uh, disabilities or for soldiers who lost their limbs or people who have accidents that lost their limbs. There is a little bit more of a civil application, and this is actually something that you can see walking around on the street. This is a gentleman. Um, um, who was born without the ability to ever see color. He could only see black and white and shades of gray. And he really wanted, he's a musician, um, um, and he really wanted to have this idea of what is color. Color seems to be so meaningful to so many people in life, and it dictates uh, a lot of the visual arts as well. And he wanted to connect that to his own world. So what people did is they implanted a, a computer chip in his brain, um, uh, and gave him a camera that reaches over his head and sits somewhere in front of his uh, face, um, uh, just about the height where his eyes sit. And that camera detects the colors that this person see sees in his field of view. Um, now, they had to use a proxy for that one. And the simple proxy is that the camera does not then tell him a color, because the color is tricky. What the camera does is it uses the wavelength of the color, translated into vibration, and gives him a vibration onto the inner ear um, inside his skull. So he essentially is uh, using synesthesia by having a, uh, an external um, uh, device attached to his brain, or at least to his skull. They don't need to interfere with his brain here. Attached to his skull that translates the wavelength of a color into a vibration. So he now hears the color around him and he's able to learn when people say green, this is the color that they mean. And for him, that has been a huge breakthrough. It looks a little bit strange, um, uh, but um, uh, the gentleman basically had an enhancement to his life that repaired, in essence, the terminology is very tricky to use. Um, uh, and I know that disabled people definitely don't like it. But it, it somehow repaired or corrected a disability that he wished for himself to have repaired. Or and finally, wrapping up on, um, uh, on all of that, what is also for civil use um, uh, of different uh, nanobiotechnologies um, uh, possible at the moment and what we are using, for example, for insulin patients, for diabetes patients already, is the very, very small sensor that doesn't need um, to be to have that doesn't um, uh, um, dictate, dictate you to actually uh, manually check your insulin level anymore. It is it would be an implant that constantly monitors um, uh, a certain level in the body. In this case, insulin. Um, here it is um, phrased to just be an implantable sensor. You can program that sensor to go after a certain biomarker. That would immediately send um, uh, some. Uh, notification to a control system, and that control system would be one that um, uh, could be worn um, externally to the body, but you can even think about systems where air, all of that is included in the body, and uh, that control system would then, when the threshold of a certain um, uh, uh, level for this biomarker in the body is triggered, it would then pump the relevant chemical into the body. And for people who need to monitor um, certain chemicals or certain um, uh, biological compounds in their body frequently in order to allow them to have a relatively normal quality of life, um, uh, for them that would basically be uh, an enhanced quality. They don't have to worry about it anymore. And it would be a lot more accurate than the punctual um, uh, measuring and administration externally as well. Not to mention it's also a hygiene question um, uh, um, you don't have to go from the outside to the inside all the time. You can have everything implanted. In the so that's just an example. It is already used the minimum invasive, that's what they are called, um, sensing devices specifically for diabetes patients and for some other patients are already um, uh, widespread and they certainly find their use in civil applications. So let me quickly wrap up. Um, uh, what I tried to tell you from the start is we're talking about an enabling technology here. We are not saying that we can all of a sudden have weapons available that were never there before. But what we're talking about is that nanotechnology and specifically the interface of nanotechnology and, nano, uh, and biotechnology to nanobiotechnology um, uh, allows us to work with everything that we know about technology and make it available to the living system on the scale where life really happens and where processes happen. 
And that means you can use it in attack, you can make super powerful bombs, you can even link them to biological agents, you can use it in defense in multiplex sensors, you can use it for the external human enhancement, the um, uh, exoskeleton that just um, allows a, uh, a soldier to put on a, uh, uh, a very light but very strong armor and thereby be able to lift things or walk for much, uh, much further than you would normally have been allowed to. Uh, or jump or climb, and um, you can use it for internal human enhancement, the delivery of neurostimulation drugs, or some of the examples of linking the external and the in internal part, as we just saw. And the one thing that um, I would like to address to the policymakers is that what makes this so very tricky, although this is not a new technology, and maybe because it is not a new technology, um, uh, it makes it very tricky to pinpoint down to what do we need to know and how do we need to interfere regarding its use in the battlefield? And that the, the problem that we are facing, it, it has incredibly high accuracy. Um, uh, so we are engineering on the molecular level. It allows an automation, which means that nobody needs to get anywhere close anymore with a high accuracy. So we're talking about a, a very, very high degree of autonomy here. And the biggest thing is that all of these things, the automation and the high accuracy means you can essentially make something that is non-detectable. Non-detectable um, beforehand and maybe um, uh, uh, even more so non-detectable um, after it has been deployed. And those are just um, uh, three points of your challenges now. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Fredericks. I think um, for those of you who haven't heard about nanomaterials before, this is a, a genuinely terrifying prospect. And for those of you who have, hopefully it's opened up some more uh, possible op opportunities and risks. And on that note, I would really like to uh, start off the discussion. I'd welcome anyone who's listening at this early time in Europe or this one o'clock time in Australia from where I'm dialing in to please put your questions uh, in the box on the side and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can within the time. So my first question is for you, Professor Zhang. I mean, I found it really interesting that you framed a lot of the advances being across a wide spectrum of different technologies. So they, the nanomaterials can be used in bioelectrics. They can also be used in biomaterials. We're looking here as a, as a delivery system for nanotechnology. Where do you see the technological advancement being greatest at the moment? Is it in the organic area or is it in other areas? I'd be, love to hear your views on that. Sorry, so uh, thank you. The, uh, I think the uh, uh, Stephen mentioned a very important uh, concept, the interface of uh, biological system yeah. and uh, in organic uh, system. <laughs> Uh, so right now, the nanobiotechnology, uh, uh, so they are some confusing, okay? Uh, the nanotechnology used in biological system or integration of biological system and nanotechnology, there are two kind of things, there are two kind of things. Uh, but mostly people uh, for both as nanobiotechnology, but personally, I think it is not correct. That's not correct. So nanotechnology, mainly, yes, you are right. Uh, many use the uh, inorganic system. They developed a fine party, uh, powder, the, uh, the uh, nanosized uh, the, uh, materials and nanosized the uh, devices and so on, uh, based on you know, inorganic materials. Um, of course, these materials may be used in biological system, but I don't think that's that that's belong to nanobiotechnology. So then, uh, when we mention about nanobiotechnology, there are two respects. One is we use the biological system to create biosensors, to create bioproducts, to create nano carriers, to create um, what, what this kind of devices and uh, even the, the uh, biological machines. Another kind of uh, 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 issue is the integration of uh, the uh, uh, biological components and in inorganic uh, components. Then 
this uh, the, the, this may use um, both the advantages from the inorganic system and the biological system. So that may be, uh, I think that 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 is the mainstream uh, uh, in in nanobiotechnology. So actually, so far, it's very uh, compared to this integration uh, strategy. The nanobio biological system using solely using biological system as a nano uh, technology uh, is it, not uh, big, is not mainstream, but uh, has very great potential because, as I showed in my slides, that the biological system. Uh, for example, a cell is full of uh, nano machines. It is, it is high efficiency, high accuracy, uh, the, the, uh, the high specificity, and the self regulation. All these uh, features are not found, cannot found in, in, in organic system. So, personally, I think uh, in, in current stage, the integration of inorganic and biological system are mainstream, but in the future, biological system will, will present its uh, unique role, very important. Maybe, I don't know, <laughs> to answer the question or not. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that was a, a really good answer. And I think it, um, it challenges, I mean, as, as Dr. Fredericks has pointed out, nanotechnology or nanobiotechnology applications are not completely new. But what we're seeing are advances. And I think for this audience, it's really interesting to think about what are the most recent advances and then where are we going in the near to short term and even long term future? I think that's a it's a stark contrast from John uh, von Neumann, who talked about the grey goo that was going to take over the world or the self-replicating paperclip idea. I mean, we, we now know that the risks and the opportunities provided by nanomaterials and nanobiotechnology applications are really vastly different from what we originally perhaps envisaged when uh, nanotechnology was, was starting to be used. I'm going to move to the question. Um, thank you, uh, Moraga. Um, hopefully I've pron pronounced that correctly. Um, there's a question about existing regulation for uh, nano, nano regulations in the question. Um, I'm going to pass that to Steffi, uh, to Dr. Friedrichs from a um, from your experience, and then I'm happy to tap in on the international law perspective. If, if you're happy for that, for us to go that way, Dr. Fredericks. Sounds like great. I'm um, uh, working hand in hand here. Thank you, Chloe. Um, um, so I have to come absolutely clear beforehand. Some of you um, uh, may have checked my biography already um, or may do it now. Um, I used to work for an industry association on nanotechnology. So I'm a believer um, uh, and I, I would be shocked by my old community if I was to say that we need more regulation in that field because I did spend quite a lot of time looking at what is available and, uh, and how one can actually live with that. That is not to say that everything is hunky-dory and nanotechnology does not need to be looked at regarding the regulation that is currently used, the oversight we currently have, and the, the checks and balances we currently have. So let me illustrate that a little bit. Um, uh, any innovation, any technological innovation will always come with uh, pushing the boundaries on um, uh, how the current existing regulation can be interpreted. If that wasn't the case, then it wouldn't be an innovation. Um, uh, but most of our civil regulation, environmental law, pharmaceutical law, has all been written um, with a degree of innovation in mind that allows to still pick up on those things that are new in the field um, uh, without having to write new regulation every time there is, a, there is an innovation. And what that means is a lot of our regulation looks at the application and at the safety of the application. That means it doesn't matter to these applications if you are making it one way or if you're making it another way. Um, uh, as long as you can prove that your application is safe, um, uh, that falls within the current regulation. What it does mean, however, is that your guiding documentation, how you get to proving that your application is safe, um, needs to be tweaked to the specific technology you're using. And that is what we spent the last 15 years on and uh, on an international level, largely through the OECD. At the time, um, uh, uh, looking at what current guidelines in, in both biological and um, chemical regulation do we have? How is nanotechnology and nanobiotechnology um, covered by that one? And do we need to um, create an additional guiding document that if you're working with a system that 
doesn't look like any of this, you need to do another test, you need to do the test differently. And, and that is, so just to give you an anecdotal example of that one, the easiest to imagine that is uh, your old chemical regulation was based on chemicals are soluble in a medium and you basically dissolve them in a medium, you have a certain concentration in that medium and then you um, use them in a biological system, which is all water-based. So they get transported by the medium into your cells, into the system, and you then detect a, uh, a behavior inside those cells. So you can you can shine light onto those cells and you can see when they stop moving or um, uh, if they're still wiggling around, they're probably happy about that chemical being in there and they're not affected by it. If they start hit, uh, wiggling even more, you definitely had an effect, but you haven't killed the cell. But in order to do that readout, you quite often need to put in um, uh, um, the, the material itself and you need to, um, uh, to, to shine, uh, to, to put a... Um, um, a dye in there, a uh, almost like a fluorescent dye that allows you to actually see those cells moving on a on a on a on a small scale. Now, some of these nanoparticles we're talking about are fluorescent in their own right, and one of the problems is they don't always necessarily go into the cell, um, uh, um, not with the without the functionality on the outside. So you can't apply your old models of how do you conduct a toxicity test. And it is down there at the level of how do you do a toxicity test where we need to give the company some guidance. And we spent a lot of money revising the tests and formulating these tests new. But your effect is still the same. Is the cell dead in the end or is it still alive? Um, uh, and that is what you're detecting. And that means if your regulation stipulates dead or alive at the end, you can cover the current technology. You have to admit, however, that you can't just use any of the off-the-shelf um, uh, um, uh, uh, reagents at the moment in order to run your tests. You can't use the off-the-shelf um, protocols. And that is where industry and um, um, regulators have worked a lot together in order to revise those. In civil regulation, it is a little bit easier, um, uh, um, simply because we want to be able to say this is new, this is extra good, because it is using nano or nanobiotechnology. So the moment you have a company um, that says, I want to put that onto the, the um, pack of my novel product, I have to prove that it is safe. So you're actually working in a field where people want to be seen to be using it and, and selling it to the world. It is the self-declaration of um, what they are doing. That is not necessarily the case in, in any um, uh, application on the battlefield. On the contrary, and that is why I think the biggest challenge is the detectability in this context. Thanks. You, thanks very much for that, Dr. Fredericks. I, it's really interesting. I think one of the questions that comes up around regulation often when I attend events is also how do you manage matter that can't be seen, which is a, a purely a, a physical question. And I think that's a, a challenge that you might be able to address uh, a little later on. From an international law perspective, I mean, as you touched upon, we have the ability to use these applications in very specific ways to deliver biological and chemical matter to the human body and particularly within the cell. And to those in the audience who work in this field, the Biological Weapons Convention and the Chemical Weapons Convention prohibit the use of these materials at that scale. The regulatory question is a really, a really interesting one, though, because unlike the Chemical Weapons Convention, where there is an annex of prohibited chemicals, as Dr. Friedrichs has already pointed out, there are challenges within identifying which of those um, substances are indeed toxic and it's worth noting that some substances at the regular scale that are not toxic can become toxic at the nano scale and so a different a different uh, regime would be needed and there would be a need to be a closer relationship between the scientists who are working at the cutting edge of the science and those who are actually doing the research another area where I think there's a gap is in environmental law we don't know what the long-term effect is of a lot of these nanomaterials and although we're talking about biotechnology applications where residues of labs or even uh, systems, so we know, for example, they're already nano-enhanced, they're mabaric weapons, which is beyond the biotech realm, but we know they exist, where those nanoparticles that are potentially toxic are then left in the environment to enter food chains and water tables, there may be long-term uh, physical, uh, severe physical effects that really states need to be, and those making policy need to be more aware of. Um, I think we should perhaps move to another question. I don't want to hear the sound of my own voice much longer. Um, there's a question which leads on quite nicely, which is there's 
these these types of substances are actually far more targeted than a lot of the weapons or the systems that we've thought about previously. And it raises, for me, it raises really interesting questions around the regulation. Is it more difficult to regulate? And I, I'm going to throw this to you again, Dr. Fredericks. Is it more difficult in your experience, this regulation of the smaller, more specific targeted materials? How, how in your experience, what have the success stories been? How have you managed to create those safeguards or those safety rails in a in the OECD context? Well, it's a, um, from a, from an immediate gut reaction, it shouldn't be more um, uh, more difficult to target something that really only does what it says on the tin and doesn't have a number of side effects. Um, uh, um, on the contrary, if you can demonstrate that it really only does what it's meant to do, specifically in the context of, uh, of pharmaceuticals, um, uh, you you need to worry much less about what are the the other side effects. You may be you may be killing the tumor of your of your incurable cancer, but you killed the patient as well because all of the side effects. That is a problem that um, uh, we can tackle by by really targeting the things more. So in essence, it should make it easier to regulate the things that are much better targeted because you don't have to have this enormous um, uh, uh, arena of other things that could happen. But you're absolutely right. Um, on the nanometer scale, we are observing some non-linear effects. That is the whole point in nanotechnology, where um, uh, we need to find out through a lot of research. Um, uh, yes, we are observing a, a beneficial effect, the one that we want to use. But what could that mean is something that we are not looking at at the moment. Um, uh, uh, so what are the side effects we're currently not thinking about? And we need to think a little bit more systemically about uh, what is one property that we want to achieve and want to harness? What might that be linked to as something that uh, also needs to be considered? And obviously, you need the maturing of a technology in order to arrive at the global understanding of an effect like that. When the nano phenomenon, um, uh, so the effects on the nanometer scale, the very scale where putting two or three atoms together and they do something that um, individual atoms don't do, but they only do in their in their first functional um, community, where those effects start to happen, and that is the nanometer scale. Um, we started looking at that, and you can't basically expect that we discover a new phenomenon, and from one day to the next, we understand everything about it, and we can answer all of the questions. And that is why I always have to say regarding the regulation part as well, we cannot accept a, uh, a moratorium in, on any of this. We need to allow research to go on because there is so much good that can be taken out of this. And I showed you many examples where medical applications are helping enhancing the quality of life and even and even are, are able to treat things that were previously untreatable. Um, uh, we have to be able to um, investigate those and to work on those. Um, uh, but we have to do that in a relatively careful context. So there's a codex of, uh, of research and development in there. And specifically with regard to the last point that you made, um, environmental effects on the battlefield, with every potential long lasting effect of a nanobiotechnological agent brought into the battlefield, you also have a beneficial effect of your nanobiotechnology probably solving a problem that you created with chemical or biological or nuclear weapons um, uh, decades ago on that same battlefield. So there is always a balance between there is an immediate benefit we can get out, but we have to try to foresee potential side effects as well. Thanks, Dr. Fredericks. I think that's an excellent point that the um, the opportunities are there as well as the risks. And sometimes it's easy to forget those in these kind of fora where we're really honed in on, you know, the, what are the dangers and the risks. The second part of that question, which I'm going to um, ask Professor Zhang, which I think is calling for a little bit of future thinking, is what do you think the the work that's going on in the nanobiotech applications field now might inspire in the future? Or what direction do you think it will take? Do you have any any thoughts about where you would either like to see it go or, or not to go, what you're most interested in progressing in the science that you're working on? Thank you. Um, I think there are, there are uh, many prom promising uh, respects uh, uh, we are looking for. So uh, for nanobiotechnology, um, we, I think the one, one is to see the molecular events in the cells, in the cells, because uh, you know we um, uh, single cell biology now is it, it, becoming popular. 
so we, if we can see these molecular events in single cell uh, or single molecular events in single cell, that's very challenging. But uh, you know, the in life process, biological process, uh, sometimes these single molecules uh, can regulate the gene expression. So if we can see the, this process, then we will understand better, much better, uh, understand the, uh, the uh, diseases development uh, uh, mechanism and a biological process mechanism. How can these single molecules, single cell, single molecules can regulate, regulate our, our life? So this is really challenging. So I think that's, that's the uh, one, one direction. Um, the second one I want to say is uh, about the uh, high throughput, high throughput the multi uh, target, uh, because uh, you know back back to 1980s when we identify first the uh, uncle gene, the gene caused the cancer, we were so happy. Then we 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 will we will solve the cancer problem in 20 years. However, 40 years passed, we found that. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the cancer is a complex diseases. So we have to uh, understand it's not single single gene uh, uh, determines. Normally, um, in most cases, it's, it's a multi-gene interaction. So if we could uh, monitor uh, multi-target in our body using the multiple uh, target biosensors, so that would be uh, uh, very, very useful. So high throughput, uh, multi, multiple target sensor, sensing. And um, I think another uh, emerging technology is nano, nano core, nano core DNA sequencing. So right now, you know, uh, because, uh, because of the technology development, so the gene, human, human genome sequencing the price, the cost of human genome sequencing decreased for one million folds. The price decreased for one million folds. So that's great uh, uh, pro, uh, uh, achievements. However, uh, so right now we uh, the gene sequence gene, gene sequence now now is uh, 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 widely used. For example, the uh, this uh, COVID COVID nineteen. Um, we need to sequence the uh, viral gene uh, in field, even in field, or in a very uh, uh, easy way. So nano pool sequencing take a very important role there. So you can you can make that with with a protein, with a single protein. The single protein has a hole, has a hole. The under the driven of the en enzyme, the, the DNA, the viral DNA can penetrate, penetrate this hole. Then the sequence will be read. So this is a very high efficient, this is a very typical uh, uh, nanobiology or bio nanotechnology uh, uh, example. So I think there are just many ways. Um, uh, one, one other example is the, uh, uh, the human human uh, organ on chip. So now we can. Uh, I mentioned before we can grow uh, the human organ on chip, and we can also integrate uh, the uh, different uh, biosensors, different sensors on that chip. We can monitor the uh, the um, metabolism uh, uh, the, uh, of the of the organ. Development of the organ and uh, the sensitive uh, the response of the organ to the uh, uh, the drugs and we can monitor all these processes by using these nano sensors. So then will that will tell us mis many mystery of our organ development and uh, so it's very useful. So just just so many so many so high sensitive, <laughs> high sensitive <laughs> small high sensitive and uh, multiple uh, detection. Yep. And so uh, right now I just mentioned about the detection and analysis. 
And there are many others, the biomaterials and uh, nano drugs and uh, bio machines and so many, it's just so many, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Zhang. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. I feel like we could have this conversation for far longer. Um, there are some questions we didn't get to about pharmaceutical uh, regulation of pharmaceutical applications, which I think raise some really interesting points which have come up throughout both of your presentations and also through the questions, which are that to contemplate regulation or even management of these types of systems, it's not, this is not a situation where it's just going to be a single state that's going to regulate. It has to be something that's done between industry and policymakers at the highest levels, as Dr. Friedrichs has worked in this field in the OECD. It's not something that can just be done unilaterally. I think the other thing that I'd really like to mention just before we before we finally finish up, and if everyone will, will join me in thanking the speakers in just a minute, is that in every type of these presentations, it's always slightly frustrating that we have to put the technologies into certain buckets. And so in this particular panel, although we've discussed nanobiotechnology, what we haven't been able to discuss is and what some of the other panels will touch upon are cloud labs, our CRISPR has nine technologies. And then in addition to that, the, some of the work that I'm looking at sitting in a computer science department, which is you know, automating some of these processes so that they're going to be, we're already seeing an increase in their development over time, but that increase is going to become exponential as our computing capacity and our algorithmic and AI capacity becomes greater as well. So. Thank you both so much for your time in the different time zones. What a delight meeting across the world without having to get on an aeroplane, I have to say. And thank you to Unity for the opportunity to have this fascinating discussion. I hope that others have enjoyed it as much as, as I certainly have. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Corby, and thank you, uh, Dr. Zhang and Dr. Fredericks, for your uh, amazing panel. It was super fascinating, and uh, we've learned a lot uh, on something as, as uh, tangible as nanotechnologies it was really really good thank you so much now this was the last panel as i mentioned at the beginning to help us understand what are the innovations from a technology perspective and as we transition into the second part of the of the conference that was going to look more at the governance we felt the need of uh, asking two uh, prominent experts and, and speakers to help us build that bridge between everything we've heard so far uh, about technologies, new technologies, new processes, new actors, and uh, their implication for uh, governance, particularly international security, arms control, and disarmament. So uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, uh, Philippe Alensos and Daniel Fix will help us understand and will help us build that bridge. Uh, without further ado, uh, Philippa, Daniel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, and good evening, and to those of uh, you joining us from the Americas, a very, very early uh, and good morning to you. My name is uh, Philip Alensos, and um, I'm here to welcome you to this all new innovations debrief session where Daniel Feeks and I will catch up on what we've heard from the panels we've had so far and get us thinking about how this links to disarmament efforts in Geneva. Um, my apologies, my camera is not working, so um, I'm afraid you won't be able to see me, but you know, that might be uh, better in any case. Um, I'll briefly remind us or ourselves about what we've covered uh, over the past couple of days. Um, before um, Daniel and I go into some some of the takeaways that we've um, uh, that we've had, um, so we kicked off the innovations uh, dialogue with the geneticist, cell biologist, and entrepreneur Andrew Hessel, who gave us a, a really great opening talk, highlighting the similarities between cells and computers, and and between biological systems and and computer networks. He um, emphasized that we're now entering an era where we can design and build organisms pretty much as easily as we can program computers. So he's really setting the, the stage there for, um, f for the, 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 the coming panels and, and you know, uh, the incredible impact these developments are going to have. We then, that then followed, was followed by three tech panels. Uh, which were structured in terms of creation, production, and delivery, providing us with a more holistic impression of the path to vaccines or, or weapons, rather than just focusing on biological agents themselves. And I thought this structuring was 
um, actually very useful for the disarmament community. The first tech panel talked to us about gene editing. And for me, the really interesting aspects were around the governance gaps of list-based approaches. And one of the questions raised was, well, how do you regulate for gene sequences found in multiple organisms? Um, and another, I thought, very pertinent question was, well, how do you regulate for gene function rather than specific pathogens or sequences? And that's certainly where it seems we should be aiming to go, um, regulating functions rather than specific pathogens or, or sequences. The um, second tech panel um, on production covered both DIY bio and cloud labs. And for me, one of the most interesting aspects here was the question of um, how you can manage safety and security risk in a non-institutionalized community like the amateur DIY community that isn't then captured by your typical top-down governance uh, structures. And I thought Todd Kukin's uh, discussion of how the community is drawing on bottom-up efforts to tap into shared norms and philosophies was really great. Um, in terms of cloud labs, and there was a really interesting questions ra question raised about how you can screen trusted partners as the customer base gets scaled up, as you expand your clients from a few big pharma and, and government players to, to smaller groups and individuals, both at home and abroad. And that's certainly going to be one of the key issues going forward for cloud lab service providers. Uh, the third tech panel that we just heard this morning um, was, as you know, on nanobiotech applications for delivery. And, and you will have all just heard that, so you don't need me to, to, to summarize that at all. But uh, just from my perspective, I think these, this idea of neuro, um, nano, sorry, nano enhancements uh, have uh, particularly disturbing potentials, um, and as does uh, the potential to develop attack weapons from nanoscale drugs delivery right into the cell. Now, if we take a step back and, and, and look at the three panels collectively, what came out for me was a very clear demonstration that there's all kinds of science going on all around the world in academic labs and private labs and classrooms and in community labs, even in converted uh, shipping containers and churches, as Todd was telling us, um, or showing us rather. Uh, and all of that work is extremely exciting uh, and it's also very fast paced. Um, but some of this work is also potentially very disruptive. Um, and this, that's obviously the, the topic that we're considering, uh, particularly now in this second uh, session of, of the, the conference. Um, and despite the heroic efforts of all the presenters, it's fairly difficult to follow all the technical details for those of us uh, who are a little removed uh, from the lab or the bench. Um, the good news is that, of course, we have, as you all know, a long-standing multi multilaterally agreed convention in place, the Biological Weapons Convention, that comprehensively prohibits the use of viruses, bacteria, and their components for non-peaceful purposes. Uh, the convention also embodies and enshrines the norm against using disease as a weapon, as well as the broader norm against using science to deliberately cause harm. Uh, one of the key takeaways from me, though, is that um, we need uh, regular systematic reviews on, of s and advances in terms of their potential security implications. Um, and a second key takeaway is that not all life science relevant science is about viruses and bacteria, as, as we just heard this morning. So in fact, most life scientists today don't actually work with bacteria and viruses. So for me, the question, uh, this or this rather, this raises a question about whether the BWC, which is focused primarily on bacteria and viruses, really covers all the potential risks from the sorts of developments we've heard about over the last couple of days. Now, I'll hope we have a little bit more time to talk about my key takeaways, but for now, I'd just like to um, uh, ask Daniel what his key uh, takeaways were from the past couple of days. Daniel? Thanks, Philippa, and, and good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Um, thanks, Philippa. Uh, a great kind of summary of the, the three panels and the keynote that we heard yesterday. So thanks for, um, thanks for doing that. I would certainly agree with you um, what you were just talking about in terms of the, the pace of developments and the way in which um, some uh, multilateral agreement like the Biological Weapons Convention can you know, kind of keep up with that pace, which only seems to be accelerating from what we heard. We heard yesterday 
you know, some of the speakers saying things that were not even on the, you know, on the horizon 10 years ago are things which are now fairly commonplace. So, you know, it's a, it's a rapidly, as you were saying, a rapidly developing area and something, you know, as we see in other uh, fields of multilateral action as well, it's quite hard for legal agreements like the Biological Weapons Convention to keep pace. So fully agree with what you said there. Um, a very interesting, you know, technical presentations that we heard. I mean, I'm a I'm a non-scientist, so two things that I took away from those, and you know, thanks to all of the panelists for sharing their their expertise and their experience with us. I mean, one of you know the first thing I took away from that really was that the range of speakers that that we've seen from you know different disciplines, different um, sectors, you know, public and private sector, and also different parts of the world. You know, I that. You know, demonstrated really clearly to me, you know, the need for for dialogue first of all, which is what we're having here now. And thanks, obviously, to um, Unidia for organising this this dialogue between, you know, science and policy. I think it's really important this aspect of having having this dialogue, and also the need for partnerships as well. For you know, talking about these things as we're doing now is is one thing, but I think it needs to be sustained beyond just this particular conversation over these last couple of days and into actual partnerships, you know, kind of continuing um, dialogues on, on these particular issues as well. And there's an important aspect as well, it's part of that is about the new communities. We heard yesterday about these DIY labs, um, you know, different groups, um, iGEM and, you know, different initiatives that are taking place. So I think there's, you know, also an issue there around partnerships. And also a lot of what we heard about yesterday was about youth as well. You know, this is a, a developing area of science, many, many students, many young scientists involved here as well. So I think it's important as well to, to address that issue. The second thing I wanted to, you know, that really came across um, from me from the presentations was we really need this kind of uh, uh, sort of comprehensive and holistic perspective that takes account of both the risks, but also the benefits of the advances in these in these technologies as well. Given that we work, you know, and I'm particularly working on the Biological Weapons Convention, servicing the meetings and so on, you know, we often focus more on the risks and on the downsides. But I, I think, you know, it's it's important, it's just as important, and the Biological Weapons Convention through its Article 10 does this, you know, to talk about the benefits of these technologies as well. And, you know, to recognise that technology in itself, you know, a particular advance isn't in and of itself risky. You know, it depends on decisions that are taken by by humans. It's, you know, decisions about how those technologies are used and applied. And I think, therefore, you can say that the human and the societal factors are, are particularly important. And that, you know, brings me back to talking about the Biological Weapons Convention, because I think normative instruments like the BWC, you know, those kind of instruments that set clear limitations on what is, what is prohibited uh, are particularly important as well. So those were just a couple of points that I, I picked up from the, um, you know, the, the presentations that we had yesterday. I mean, Philippa, you've been working on, you know, and observing BWC meetings for, for many, many years now and sitting through different workshops and publishing yourself very widely too. Um, so I wondered, what are your observations on how science and technology issues are discussed within the BWC and what you might see as areas that in, in ways that it could be improved? Well, um, thanks, Daniel. Uh, at the moment, you know, science and technology review is the responsibility of, of individual states' parties. Um, but I think it's also important to do so collectively, so to have a collective uh, review. And, and uh, a dedicated technical process would then provide, you know, a more robust, more comprehensive technical foundation that we can then build um, better policies on, essentially. So I think it's really important that we get some sort of collective s and review uh, in place. Um, and uh, it just so happens that this actually is one of the few areas that most state parties agree on. They agree on the importance of having some sort of collective review process in place. Um, but the details of how you're going to do that are, are, are still uh, very difficult to find agreement on. So the sorts of things that are still uh, to be settled, essentially, and, and this will surely be one of the key topics at the upcoming review conference. Um, but some of the details um, that are still to be decided on, you know, is should this be an open-ended process or should it be a closed process? And if it's a closed process, how should members be elected or, or nominated? And 
uh, of course, that membership um, should be based on technical credentials. But how broad or how narrow uh, do you draw the disciplinary lines? Do we, for instance, include uh, nano biotech uh, experts? Um, do we include cloud lab uh, manufacturer service providers, for instance? Um, and then the very thorny question of, of how do you deal with geographic representation? Um, and there are uh, difficult questions around the scope um, or terms of reference. Should the group, should should a, a, a review group be focusing on on just identifying trends, S and T trends, or should they really be be considering the the security implications? Should they be looking at both benefits and risks, or only the risks? Um, who who decides what should be covered, right? The chair or states parties, or is there a mandate given at a review conference? How, how does this work? Uh, cost, of course, always a massive issue. Who covers these costs? Um, there are also questions around uh, guidance and coordination. Who Who's going to provide oversight? Uh, who chairs it? Where does the admin support come from? Of course, that's one. Uh, you know, a uh, that's one that's relevant to you, Daniel. Uh, a, a dedicated scientific officer in the ISU would be, you know, fantastic. Uh, but of course, that then requires funding. So a lot of uh, unanswered questions or technical details that still need to be uh, figured out, I think. But the importance of having this sort of a review, I think, is recognized um, by, by most. Um, but given these challenges, Daniel, what do you think are the key factors that delegates should bear in mind in their discussions on s and issues within the BWC? Thanks, Philippa. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think, I mean, it, it's a real multifaceted area. It involves, as we've been seeing over the last couple of days, a whole range of different expertise and different actors. And it's really, you know, a, a prime example in, you know, in the modern world of what people talk about when they talk about science diplomacy. You know, we're not just talking about disarmament you know, in the traditional sense, I guess, anymore. You look back at previous uh, lists of participants at BWC meetings, they were generally attended, you know, at the national level, the delegations were generally made up of, of diplomats um, from ministries of foreign affairs, you know, likely also people from ministries of defense, you know, the kind of security experts. We look at them nowadays, you know, from recent BWC meetings, you know, the national delegations are made up of, you know, a whole range, a kind of whole of government um, approach has been taken, you know, with people from ministries of health, environment, education, s and um, industry, you know, first responders, law enforcement, uh, you know, it's a real, real cross um, governmental approach that's taken now by, by many states. And that's, you know, reflected across the international system. It's not a development that's just um, unique to the BWC and to disarmament, I don't think. You see it also when, you know, when there are international discussions on climate change, um, public health, you know, for example, now with um, COVID-19 is a real, you know, again, a sense of joined up um, approach needed at both the national and international level. And also on other issues, you know, relating to, for example, I know intellectual property, um, cyber issues, you know, many, many issues across the, the breadth of international discussions these days. Fortunately, many of these issues are also dealt with here in Geneva. So um, the diplomats and, and those of you who are listening in um, now who are diplomats here in Geneva, you know, you're particularly well placed to operate in this environment. You don't necessarily need um, you know, expertise, training, qualifications in the life sciences. But, you know, it's good to have um, a general understanding of the main issues and obviously the event today and yesterday and, you know, the technical presentations we've heard um, have helped in that regard. But I think it's also important for people to know where to find the required expertise, um, know which questions to ask of, of their experts. And also, you know, particularly important is how to translate that expert advice um, into policy and, you know, particularly into the kind of language that's used in, you know, in the diplomatic meetings and particularly in the reports emanating from those meetings as well. And there's certainly a need for also for coordination and dialogue, again, going back to what I said before, between um, different fora. For example, here in Geneva, uh, as well as BWC meetings, we have something called the UN Commission on um, Technology and Development. It has a Commission on Science and Technology for Development. That body has also been discussing issues like synthetic biology, you know, similar issues to those that we discuss within the BWC, but they're coming 
you know, very much from the, the side, the perspective of the beneficial purposes and sustainable development. But, you know, those discussions are, you know, discussions on the same issues, the same technologies, but coming at them from different angles. So I think it, it's important to to coordinate and to kind of foster dialogue between these different fora and different communities as well. And, you know, th this may be easier here because, as I mentioned, many of these things are actually taking place here in Geneva as well. Um, Philippa, I just wanted to go back to something that you said at, at the beginning in your in your opening comments. You said about whether all of the developments that we've heard about are actually um, covered by the BWC. I wondered if you would just, in the the short time that we have remaining, if you would just want to elaborate slightly on that point. Sure, sure. Thanks. Yeah, I, I do think this is kind of one of the big key questions coming out of this dialogue, right? Does the BWC still cover all of these developments that we've been hearing about? Uh, and I, I think the answer to that is yes and no. Um, so we know that states parties agree that the BWC absolutely covers all viruses, bacteria, and toxins, whether they're naturally uh, or artificially uh, created uh, or indeed altered. Um, so, uh, and the BWC also covers their components, so individual sequences and things, right? Uh, so, it, so the convention is pretty darn comprehensive when it comes to microbes and biological agents. Uh, and, and, you know, I take my hat off to the original drafters of, of the convention for, for uh, doing so, do, writing it in such a broad way and, and uh, allowing for advances. Um, but there are some cases where it is more questionable, right? I mean, what if um, you use an entirely synthetic base structure? or a set of base structures. So creations that are, for instance, inspired by DNA or RNA, but actually don't qualify as DNA, RNA, or, or any other known naturally occurring nucleic acid. Um, and, and what if those synthetic base structures are made to deliver payloads into human bodies, for instance, but that instead of having direct detrimental effects on our bodies, or that of any organism, they just interfere with biological processes or, or perform purely mechanical functions. Would that then be covered? And there is some debate here uh, in the expert community about whether that then would be covered, because then you're not actually talking about DNA or RNA, right? You're talking about synthetic constructs that just mimic them. Um, and I think this is a real concern because potential future biological weapons won't necessarily just make us sick. They could directly target our immune system instead, or directly target our nervous system, or our genome, or our microbiome, right? We have to think how biological weapons might look differently, might behave differently in the future. Um, so the legal status of novel biological agents or of developments in science and technology in general is a really important uh, issue. But for me, what matters even more is whether militaries actually find new agents and developments attractive and perceive them as useful. Because if they do, the balance of incentives and disincentives that determine compliance with BWC obligations could then be uh, affected. Um, certain S&T advances could alter the socio-political calculations of states about the utility of DNA-inspired weapons, and these new calculations could drive further development of such weapons. And that is really something that should uh, concern us all, I think, and really underlines the importance of strengthening or bolstering the norm against biological weapons and speaks to what you were saying, uh, Daniel, about the importance of dialogue and awareness raising um, and, and really making sure we're all on the same page uh, and understand um, not just the letter of the law, but the, the you know the intent of this law, so the norm that it in, the BWC uh, embodies. So um, that's a lot for me. I'm going to now turn over to you, Daniel, for any final uh, words you have. But uh, thanks for the conversation. That's been really useful from my side. Likewise, Philippa. No, thank, thanks for your inputs as well. It's been good to talk. And I know we had many more things that we could have spoken about, but time is against us, unfortunately, as well. So, um, yeah, thank, thanks to you. Thanks to everyone who's been listening. Um, I hope it's, for those of you watching and listening, I hope this brief discussion that Philippa and I have had and with a few reflections from, from our side has helped to um, serve as a useful transition, basically, from the tech-focused talks to the upcoming discussions that we'll have after the break on the governance of these emerging tech 
technologies, particularly for those of you in the audience who are, um, you know, diplomats and, and policy makers as well. So um, we'll finish there. Thanks again from Philippa and I, and I think I will hand now back to um, Giacomo. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Philippa, for an excellent session. Uh, this is exactly what we needed to make the transition, as you said, uh, between the first part and, and the second part of the conference. Uh, your, you know, the conversation between the two of you was the perfect kind of scene setter for what's coming next. Uh, after a, a, a short break, uh, we will be having a, a panel that covers multilateral governance of innovation, science and technology in the life sciences, particularly trying to explore uh, even further, what are some of the gaps uh, in relation to governance? What lessons can we learn from uh, other processes that have been dealing with uh, uh, dual use technologies? And really this panel uh, will be, uh, it's probably the biggest panel of, of the conference in terms of number of, uh, of speakers, but also range of different perspectives and, and views on, on the topic. Uh, and this will be then uh, the kind of the, the leading panel to our final session where we're going to bring everything back down to the multilateral and the UN uh, level through uh, a moderated discussion with very high level speakers. So welcome back. Good, good morning. It's still morning here in Geneva. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever else you may be in the world. Um, I am Daniel Feeks. I'm, you may remember me from the panel just before the break. I'm the head of the implementation support unit of the Biological Weapons Convention based here in Geneva in the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs. So we're here in this panel to discuss multilateral governance of innovation, science and technology in the life sciences within the overall context of the, the innovations dialogue on the life sciences, international security and disarmament. As Giacomo said at the end of yesterday's session and said again just before the break, before this panel, that we're really moving in now to the second part of the innovations dialogue in which we're looking more closely at the governance issues, including whether there are any gaps, and if so, ways in which those gaps could be filled. The overarching question which guides all of the discussions was shown in the video that was running just before this panel. And that question was, how can we harness the benefits while mitigating the risks of innovations in the life sciences? In order to address these issues, we have what um, Giacomo just told us is the largest panel of the event so far. We've got a total of five panelists. In the interests of time, all of them have agreed not to give individual presentations, but what we're going to do instead is to have an interactive discussion based around a series of broad questions. And obviously there will also be time at the end for questions from you in the audience as well. So before we get started, I'd like to quickly introduce all five panelists and then get straight into the discussion. I would encourage you to read the more detailed biographies of the panelists which are available on the website for this event because I will just briefly introduce each of them now. So, as I mentioned before, we've got five panelists in total. Um, we're joined by Nezreen Alhmud, who's the director of the Center for Excellence in Biosafety, Biosecurity and Biotechnology at the Jordan Royal Scientific Society. We're also joined by Cheng Tang, who is an advisor to the Chinese National Authority for the Chemical Weapons Convention and was the former chair of the OPCW's Scientific Advisory Board. Also joining us is Abhi Veera Kumar Sivam, who is the co-chair of the ASEAN Young Scientists Network and head of the Department of Biological Sciences at Sunway University in Malaysia. We're joined also by Louise Bezaldenhout, who's a research fellow at the Institute for Science, Innovation and Society at the University of Oxford. And finally, we're joined by Yantina de Vries, who's an associate professor in bioethics at the Department of Medicine of the University of Cape Town and is also a member of WHO's Advisory Committee on Developing Global Standards for Governance and Oversight of Human Genome Editing. So welcome to all of our panelists um, today and thank you for taking the time to join us. So with the introductions over, I'd like to get straight into the discussion. For those of you watching this panel, as I just said, please remember that you can submit questions and you can do that at any time during our discussion. As soon as something pops into your head, please feel free to use the dedicated Q&A chat box in the WebEx application. Um, no need to wait until the discussion is over and the Q&A session starts. You can ask a question via the chat box at any stage and then I will try and address um, as many of those as possible to our panelists once we're finished with the, with the main discussion. 
So I'd like to get in first of all, as I said, we've got a series of um, questions that, that I would like to put to the panelists. Um, the first of those questions, and this really relates to one of the points which came up in the earlier panels on the, on the different technologies, and this, this came up in, I think, all three of the panels, was the possible need for new instruments to address some of the emerging challenges in this field. Therefore, I'd like to start by asking each of our panelists if they agree with this assessment, and if so, what such new government instruments to address dual use technologies might look like. And if I could, um, Nizreen, I'd like to ask you to go first, please. Thank you, Daniel. I'd like first to thank the organizers, uh, the UNIDIR, for inviting me today for this panel, to speak in this panel. Uh, actually, governance, uh, legislation, the regulation and policy are increasingly lagging behind technological developments. So, new governance methods at the national and international level will need to be developed to keep pace with these rapid developments and changes. Examples of legal lag, we have a lack of enforceable international guidelines surrounding human subjects research. So science is no longer centered around academia, as corporations and other models enter the research field, the only reason they have to adhere to any current international guidelines regarding human subject research is the hope of being published in an academic journal. For anyone who is not motivated by publications, there is no way to compel any way to follow ethical standards of research. While this is a life science problem, it becomes pressing when we reach dual use areas such as vaccine development. Another you know, example is a voluntary code of conduct on dual use risk management for the life science industry. At present, the level of engagement with dual use issues, biological security, and the Biological and Toxin Weapon Convention within the life science industry remains low. So it is likely that the development of voluntary mechanism for the management of dual use research could take between five to ten years. However, this time frame should be considered tentative since the development of a viable self-regulatory mechanism requires a shared recognition of its utility and value within life science industry. Thank you. This is all from my side. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nizreen, for getting off to a great start. Um, Louise, could I put the same question to you now, please? It's one about new, um, possible new governance um, instruments. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, just as a, um, a, a proviso, I'm going to be speaking specifically from an African perspective. Um, I'm going to be speaking about my research with um, life science researchers in Africa, looking at how they engage with uh, dual use discussions. Um, and the point I wanted to make was that uh, on the African continent, there's considerable investment in research development and innovation. And uh, this is happening at the same time that uh, many countries are still developing comprehensive biosecurity um, uh, governance structures and, and integrating dual use discussions into their, their thinking about governance. Um, so this creates a really interesting situation in which much of the funding for RDI in Africa is coming from the global north and is associated with expectations about biosecurity. Um, and this is being imported through the funding uh, requirements and uh, the expectations placed on African researchers. And this creates a very problematic situation as um, RDI contexts in Africa uh, differ considerably from uh, those in the global north, um, both physically in terms of infrastructure, <clears throat> uh, socially and also economically. And um, what we really need to see is um, developing governance structures that positively support RDI in these different contexts, uh, rather than shutting them down because the expectations um, and requirements imposed on the researchers um, do not align with the context in which they're working. So I feel that we need more engagement to be able to align the expectations coming uh, through the funding uh, from the Global North with uh, the African innovation landscape as it evolves. Um, and this point really extends to um, another area that I think has been touched on in, um, in the conference already that uh, in Africa, like in the rest of the world, a lot of uh, data production and innovation is happening outside of, non -tra uh, of traditional academic landscapes. 
And we're seeing considerable growth uh, on the continent in uh, non-traditional RDI spaces like citizen science spaces, maker spaces, um, but also small scale innovation and startup. And these, um, while they are still problematic to integrate into uh, regulation in the global north, have been largely overlooked uh, on the African continent. And there's a lot of engagement and uh, thought that needs to go behind how to uh, regulate and support these communities um, in their activities. Uh, so all in all, data production is, is increasing quite rapidly on the African continent. And comprehensive strategies are really needed to introduce biosecurity and dual uses topics uh, in the involving data governance uh, regulation landscape. Um, so I think I'll end there for now. Excellent, great. Thanks very much, Louise, and thanks, you know, particularly for bringing an African perspective to this as well. And I think that's one of the advantages with the panel um, that we've that Unidir has assembled for us here today is that you will bring your own different regional and um, you know discipline specific perspectives to this as well. So, so great. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'll pass the floor now to to Abi over there in Malaysia. Abi, over to you. Yeah, um, I guess you know I, I would I would like to echo what Nazrin and Louise have. Uh, you know, mentioned, and I guess what I'll add in is, you know, I, I'm not convinced um, that we really need new instruments per se, uh, but I think um, as we appreciate dual use potential of emerging technologies, and I think there are many reports that are coming out, for example, from Unidir about things like big data and nanotech. Um, the, these technologies now, are, you know, beyond life sciences and the whole dialogue on dual use now expands beyond life sciences. So for me, um, the question would be, how would we use the existing instruments to ensure that, um, you know, these instruments become more inclusive, uh, more comprehensive so that they cover um, all these different gaps that perhaps, um, you know, have not been addressed. So especially in the context of, you know, for example, at least in the part of Asia, uh, thanks to the great initiatives by the BWC, you know, in, in sort of promoting, you know, um, you know, at least international guidelines that we were then able to use to contextualize and what have you, um, at least for most part in this region, um, there is significant uh, awareness, um, at least by the, the people that are formulating uh, the policies on the safety and security, especially in the context of research planning and, and monitoring. Uh, institutional review committees uh, now are ubiquitous in all you know, institutions uh, of repute. Um, and also you know, risk mitigation, um, maybe not as locally contextualized as much as you would want in this part of the world, but at least um, you know, the same technical considerations that are recommended uh, by, um, you know, code of conducts and, and various different uh, uh, regulations are uh, actually put in place. Um, so I guess my point here is that how can we make sure that, you know, the instruments uh, that are in, in position now is able to uh, be adapted so that we cover um, the, 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 the larger, you know, sort of experiments that might have uh, dual use. That's it then. Thanks. Thanks very much, Abby. And I think the the issue of, you know, how existing instruments can be adapted will come up um, later in our discussions as well. So look look forward to hearing if you have any other other views on that as well. Um, thanks very much. I'd like to turn turn now to Cheng. Cheng, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, I, I would like to add uh, here just uh, um, as one of our. Uh, presenter or panelists said the dual use technology uh, is like a double edged sword. As we have been uh, listening uh, to the discussions yesterday and this morning, the dual use technology in life science, like gene editing, cloud lab, nanotechnology, are amazingly fast developing in recent years. It is no doubt that it will benefit human beings. However, at the same time, the possibility of misuse of those technology are also increasing, such as the creation, production, and delivery by biological uh, agents or by terrorists uh, on governance of the dual use chemical. Comparing the two governance instruments, the PWC and the CWC, we can easily find that there is a gap. The PWC is far less developed compared to the CWC. In case of CWC or OPCW as it's the implementing body, in addition to the main priority of chemical disarmament to realize a world free of chemical weapons, it has a well-developed regime to control the dual-use chemical. 
relevant to the CWC. Therefore, the effective verification regime, mainly the data monitoring plus on-site inspection, is something missing from the BWC in order to address the use of uh, the issue of dual use technology. My second point uh, is related to the code of conduct. Some uh, already mentioned, although we uh, we already different uh, institutions has their own code. Uh, in the past few years, I have been uh, invited by you, Daniel, uh, to share OPCW's experience on drafting and uh, implementing of the Hague ethical guidelines at the meeting of experts or during the margin of the meeting of states parties of the BWC in Geneva. I believe the OPCW's Hague ethical guidelines calls on all chemical practitioners to practice responsible chemistry for peaceful purposes in supporting uh, the implementation of the BWC, uh, CWC. This is also something which I believe it could be enhanced here to establish a code of conduct for professionals in life sciences to support the implementation of the BWC. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cheng, and sorry for the, the technical problems that we encountered there, but we, we heard you fine anyway, so thanks for that. Um, Yantina, over, over to you for any, any final thoughts on this first question, please. Great, thanks, um, Daniel. So I, I really liked the perspective that Abi shared, which and which I broadly agree with, um, which is that I think I think the the, the question isn't do we need new new instruments or, or perhaps, it, but it's about re-emphasizing um, issues such as dual use technology, for instance, through capacity building um, activities that that Louise drew our attention to. But I would say that I think there is one important gap um, that, that we do need to think much more critically about, and that is national and international um, mechanisms for whistleblowing and um, including protections for, for whistleblowers. And ideally kind of thinking more critically about uh, mechanisms that can cover both the private and the public sector. And that's not a trivial, it's not, not a trivial thing to do, um, but, but I think that's possibly one of the gaps that I see. Thanks. Thanks very much, Antina, as well. And thanks to you all for, for your answers to those to do that first question as well. Um, some of you have already touched upon um, and, and said that, you know, it may be not that we need new instruments, it's that we need adaptations or improvements to to existing. And uh, as you know, and as many of you have referred to, this is an area kind of different to some other areas of new and emerging technologies where there, there aren't really any um, particularly any kind of hard law existing instruments. In this area, you know, when we're talking about the life sciences, as, as many have already referred to, we do have um, well, one in particular hard law instrument, the Biological Weapons Convention, which is now 45 years old. And there are also a number of other arrangements. Yesterday, there were some references, for example, to the Australia Group um, on export controls. And some of you just now mentioned about existing governance instruments as well. So I'm just wondering, you know, as, as a second question for you all, really, what in terms of these existing governance instruments, how, how can these be adapted? Do you have any specific ideas as to how such instruments could be adapted to fill these gaps? Now, Cheng, I was going to give, give the floor to you first here. I, I believe you had a slide to be, um, to be shown here, and perhaps you wanted to elaborate on the point that you made earlier. And I was just going to say if our Unidir colleagues may perhaps be able to show that slide, but I think they're already doing that. So, Cheng, can I pass to you first, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to add a point here is that uh, taking the CWC as an uh, example, uh, the verification uh, regime of CWC can provide confidence to the state's parties. You can see uh, the figure for your easy reference. Here, the, in the past 10 years of OPCW, each year they have been conducting more than 200 inspections to those chemical industry who declared by state's party producing uh, dual-use chemicals. These figures you can see, starting from 2014, uh, fixed at 241. The dual-use chemicals under the CWC are listed in uh, three schedules as the annex on chemicals of the CWC, based on the risk of those chemicals posed to the objectives and the purposes of the convention. The verification regime uh, for these chemicals include data monitoring, 
the um, this is mainly a uh, uh, declaration or submission of data by state's party as annual uh, national declaration, plus on-site inspection, which is mainly conducted by the OPCW inspectors at this site. The basic principle of the OPCW inspection mechanism is uh, based on the trust but verify. The confidence of the state's party to the CWC is coming uh, from both well-established verification regime under the convention and the strict implementation of those uh, measures. Just like uh, Mr. Robert Floyd, the Director General of uh, Australia Safeguards in Non-Proliferation Office tweeted after an, uh, Article 6, that's the uh, industry inspection in Australia in 2018, Routine inspections by OPCW of the industrial chemical facilities builds confidence that Chemical Weapons Convention CWC member states are not developing chemical weapons. I believe that to, uh, to address the dual-use technology in life science related to the PWC, the national experts and the policymakers should carefully and lessons learned from implementing of the verification re regime by OPCW in the past three years. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cheng, and thanks thanks for the slides as well. It's a, a nice reminder for me. It reminds me of my six years I spent working at the OPCW as well. So it's good to see good to see those things as well. Um, Abby, I'd like to give you um, the, the floor now to answer the same question. You already said that you, you know, you, you believe that existing instruments could be um, updated and adapted. So I wondered if you had any any specific thoughts, any specific ideas in that regard. Thanks. Thanks very much, Abby, as well, and thanks for raising this issue of um, culture of responsibility and and also the issues that you raised about the awareness, you know, awareness amongst students and things. I think that's a, that's a, a key issue too. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Nazreen. To any any issues, any perspectives from where you are there, Nazreen? Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I'd like to stress on the need to have a voluntary code of conduct on dual use risk management for the life science industry. One of the topics that is being considered under the current intersessional process of the BTWC is the possible development of a model code of conduct for those engaged in biology and related fields. An international model code that has been developed under the auspices of the BTWC could provide a framework for the promulgation of biological security codes and charters within the life science industry. The international model code could be similar to the Hague Ethical Guidelines and the 2005 IAP Biosecurity Statement. Another point is the implementation of coordinated national and regional task force for biorisk management and research oversight. This issue might have been realized between five to 10 years ago when several stakeholders start to invest in knowledge and training regarding dual use research. Therefore, the implementation of a national guidelines or policies is encouraged. An indicator for successful collaboration would reduce redundant projects and would enhance team building measures and specialization. This point has an implication for low and middle income countries. There is a need to enhance the quality of research and safeguard scientific outcomes from misuse. In my region, the Middle East and North Africa, where no core heart policies are available to control life science research. I'd like to finalize uh, the point that was emphasized by Louise, uh, where she touched based on that point in her answer to the first question, where there is a need to enforce intellectual property governance for their in accordance to the Nagoya Protocol. We have a complex interplay of high disease burden in low and middle income countries, which has made these countries of primary focus for medical research. However, due to mutation in resources and technology, this requires that the samples are often sent out to developed economies and countries for analysis. Governments of samples that have been shipped off is of a great concern to these countries, especially the coordination of intellectual property issues. The Nagoya Protocol has been established to ensure benefit sharing between both countries, the country that sells the samples and the country that receives the sample for analysis. However, the Nagoya Protocol 
uh, is still in its infancy and it's yet to be gain traction in this uh, attraction in these countries in the low middle income countries. There is a critical need for stringent governance around intellectual property for them. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks very much, Nazreen. Um, Louise, um, Nazreen just referred to something you said anyway. Louise, would you like to add anything on this question? Um, sure, thank you, Daniel. Um, so just thinking again about uh, dual use uh, from a, a researcher perspective, um, traditionally dual use uh, governance um, in research has focused on two big areas. The first is controlling physical inputs and outputs of research, and the second is uh, controlling the, the, the movement of uh, information through published articles and, and data. Um, and I think uh, for, for the African continent, both of those areas can be very effectively populated by existing structures. So, for instance, um, because there is a lot of work going into developing research capacity in Africa, there are a lot of institutions and organizations that are starting to develop policies and guidance for uh, open science, for data sharing, um, and for data protection. And all of these organizations, such as the African Open Science Platform, the Infrastructural Alliances, and the um, African Academies of Sciences, uh, could be engaged with to extend, um, uh, to, to engage with um, discussions about dual use and to be able to integrate um, issues of dual use into their uh, current um, practices and the way that they're engaging with researchers. Um, it's really important on that note to recognize that uh, traditionally policy development in Africa has been quite sectorally siloed, uh, meaning that there hasn't been a lot of communication between the research and innovation uh, sectors and the security um, sectors. And it would be really important to start getting better channels of, of communication between the RDI and the security sectors. Um, but then in terms of the physical uh, inputs and outputs of, of research, that um, another key area to consider is leveraging on the evolving trade agreement landscape on the continent, and particularly engaging with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, which is currently under discussion to ensure that dual use is um, included in the current negotiations. And this, I feel, would really strengthen um, research capacity in Africa in the future and ensure that the, the future RDA landscape is not only responsive to dual use issues, but also optimally supports African research and innovation. Um, but what is really needed for this is clarity um, of the concepts to ensure that basic research is uh, protected and promoted. Thank you. Excellent, great. Thanks, thanks very much, Louise, and thanks for those specific, you know, specific ideas and examples as well. Um, Yantina, can I give the the floor to you before we move on to the third question, please? Great. Yes, you can. And and the advantage of um, of going last is that you can draw another speaker's contribution. So contribution. So I think I think both Abby and, and Louise um, spoke about aspects that I think are absolutely essential. So Abby, I I really liked. Um, your your concept of a culture of responsibility because that, that's where I see the gap uh, as being and obviously the moment we start speaking about a culture of responsibility we, we, we're not so long no longer just speaking about an application of certain principles but actually training people to recognize to have we, we call that virtue ethics but training people to recognize um, problematic applications for instance as they're in development and, and knowing what to do um, and wanting to do the right thing. Now, I, I think both Louise um, and Abby and, and Nasreen perhaps spoke about kind of building on, on what's already there. And I, I can see two important ways in, that, in, that, in which that will happen. So one is in, in research ethics, we've got a vast infrastructure on the African continent, um, a vast infrastructure uh, around research ethics um, with many networks, capacity building initiatives, uh, national councils that work really well. Of course, we've got lots of countries or, or some countries in which there are no national councils, but in many there are re councils that work really well. There's, there's clear guidelines on, on what, um, on the, the boundaries of research ethics or, 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 or what, what uh, good and ethical research entails. Now, what that network doesn't do is it doesn't effectively regulate or provide guidance for industry. And so I would say that in, in response to this question, how can, we, how can we use existing kind of infrastructure to fill the gaps? I would say that we'd need to spend more time uh, building 
re relations uh, with industry um, in the research ethics realm, in addition to placing emphasis on dual use issues as a key ethical concern. Um, I just want to echo there Louise's point, um, which is about the siloing and, and or the, 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 the siloing of research ethics on the one hand and biosecurity on the other. And I think in this particular challenge, the, the, these issues are, are really um, linked. And then also just want to point out that, that at least in the African continent, there are many really strong regional platforms. Um, so I mentioned that that's true for, for research ethics. But it's also true for the regulation of life sciences. So just to mention one example, um, we are seeing the emergence of quite strong regional and continental leadership on um, gene drive technologies, particularly as applied to uh, mosquitoes. So the African um, Union has recognized that as a key area of development. Um, it has given a mandate to um, Auda Nepat to um, to, to help nation states in developing um, regulation around that. The ECOWAS, the, the West African um, Economic Alliance, um, has actually organized um, regulation, so, so is, is already coming together to develop harmonized um, ethics review guidelines for, um, for, for the review of genome drive or gene drive, um, uh, the introduction of gene drive field testing. So there's, there's really interesting um, experiences arising in that field that we could draw on. That's what I wanted to say. Over to you, Daniel. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Antina, as well. Um, thanks thanks so far for all of your questions. I'm, I'm just looking at the clock as well, and I know we have, a, you know, obviously a fixed time that we need to finish. So I, I'm just, um, I'd just like to request all of you um, when answering the, the upcoming questions as well, if you could keep your, your, you know, your answers to those as concise as possible, while, while obviously still having time to get across your, your own, you know, key points and messages as well. I just want to move on to, to another question, and I'm just looking at the, the chat, the questions that we're receiving as well, and some of these some of your answers now may actually address some of the questions we're we're being posed already and then we can come to some others when we have the q a session at the end um but third question i wanted to pose to the five of you involves you know all the discussions we heard yesterday and this morning about new actors becoming involved in this field and again some of this has come out in your answers already to the first two questions but given this given the emergence of new actors um is a multi-stakeholder approach to governance desirable and feasible in in this area from your own perspectives what do you think um, and what are the key issues to be considered? Now, some of you have touched on some of these already, but perhaps you may want to use this as an opportunity to elaborate or refer to um, specific examples. Um, and this time, um, Yantino, I'd like to give you the floor first this time. So you're, <laughs> you can kick us off first rather than coming last this time round. Over to you. Great, thank you. So, so I would say that, so, so if the question is, is this desirable? The answer is absolutely yes. And I think it's probably more than desirable. It's actually probably verging towards being a requirement. Um, and, and I think engagement, not just about this particular challenge, but rather about the desirability of certain technological or scientific developments. Um, so so you, you mentioned in the introduction that I'm part of a WHO group that is trying to develop and a group of experts trying to develop governance, global governance framework for um, geno, human genome editing. And in that, we, def, we, we strongly emphasize the importance of multi-stakeholder engagement in the development of regulation. But in, in making that recommendation, we encountered several really important challenges. Um, and one is that in many countries, um, there is no tradition of public engagement and multi-stakeholder development. And that's a real challenge um, because you can't necessarily, I think Abi mentioned a kind of a, a hierarchical culture where, uh, where, where engagement hasn't, ha isn't necessarily part and parcel of how regulations are developed. Um, another really important challenge is that there is a really scanty evidence base on how to do engagement properly. Um, so, for instance, it's not clear at all what it means to be representative, um, how to account in engagement for inherent power differentials, um, and, and, and who needs to be engaged. Um, but, but again, just to emphasize that, that there are really important experiences that we already have. So, um, you know, in, in South Africa, we have several initiatives. So, for instance, the development of the genome um, genome foods regulations involved different levels of stakeholders um, and, and that's 
you know, that's that's really good um, and a really good example of, of how this could be done. Over to you. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Jantina, and thanks for keeping it concise as well. Thanks for that very, very much. Um, Abi, over over to you again, over there in Malaysia. Yep. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I 100% I, I agree, you know, with Jantina, yeah, yeah, with, like, with Jantina, sorry, uh, that this is no longer, uh, uh, you know, whether it's desirable or not. In fact, it's a necessity. And um, and especially with, with new actors uh, in this whole field, I mean, we talk about, you know, trying to create a greater discourse on, on regulations and biosecurity implications. It also impacts on innovations, and that's why these multi-stakeholder uh, engagements are really important. Um, the, the point I, I guess I want to bring in is about, you know, this particular actor that I know you have got a forum uh, dedicated for this, and this is DIY Bio, and especially with this whole COVID-19 pandemic, you know, you have had, you know, new solutions, for example, in Australia, supposedly a new uh, diagnostic kit might not be, reg you know, approved by regulators. Uh, but, you know, that that the solutions are no longer, you know, just um, the rights of traditional research institutions. Um, you know, solutions can be found anywhere. Um, yet there are also increased, you know, regulations and fears, for example, in, in, in California, uh, the use of, um, you know, CRISPR uh, kits um, are, are, are not allowed beyond the professional labs. So um, together with the Global Young Academy and the Volkswagen Foundation, we uh, conducted two uh, surveys and we are finally concluding uh, our reports. Um, and one was understanding bio-risk perceptions of different groups, especially in the context of these DIY bio experiments. And the second was about understanding the landscape of DIY bio ecosystems, especially in you know, their biosecurity and biosafety considerations. And, and I'm not gonna go into detail of the, the findings, but I, you know, in this particular question, uh, I've got two points that um, at least the experience of running these two surveys. Um, first is that, you know, while we were lucky that quite a number of DIY biologists responded, you know, to the survey, um, I also received many emails from concerned uh, DIY biologists from around the world who were skeptical and perhaps even cynical of my motives. Uh, and much of these concerns stems from the fear, what would the study findings, you know, be used for, you know, to, if, for example, if it's to increase oversight and overregulation, um, they were like, you know, I'm not going to legitimize this survey. So it was really important to engage and to even convince them that you know we will provide them you know a draft response uh, a summary before we even you know sort of make those findings to legitimize it and you know we had to make sure that it was clear that our intent was agnostic um but also for them to appreciate that while the diy bio landscape for much is you know a very collaborative space it is evidently very heterogeneous um so you know that's that need to build that trust that you know you need to um, you know engage these individuals to come out so that we can you know necessarily uh, engage with them. Um, and then the second one was the findings of the bio risk uh, survey uh, you know on, on perceptions. And what uh, we found is that in general uh, the public um, the bio risk levels for DIY experiments were deemed to be medium or high range. And you might wonder what does that actually mean. But just to give context is that when the same case scenarios were presented in professional uh, research institutions, uh, the risk levels uh, reduced uh, dramatically. At least 90% of respondents uh, felt that the risk was uh, less or negligible. So um, there were also some subtle associations with gender as well as you know how competent they were in terms of STEM uh, or experience in STEM and that affected their perceptions. So for me, what I'm getting out of that is just showing you that um, that there are so much of differences in perceptions of biases uh, that, especially in the context of you know multi uh, stakeholders, uh, we have to ask ourselves how might we you know also um, you know sort of limit our inherent biases and be cognizant of that uh, when we want to try and engage uh, in a multi stakeholder uh, participation. Thanks very much, Abby. Um, Louise, I'd like to put the same question to you now as well. This this issue of multi-stakeholder engagement and whether it's feasible and and those kinds of issues. Louise, over to you. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, so, of course, in in um, agreement with Yantina and Abby, that multi-stakeholder engagement is vital. Um, 
And I really want to support what Yantina has been saying. Um, from an African perspective, multi-stakeholder engagement is um, both very important, but also um, very problematic because there is little public tradition of uh, multi-stakeholder engagement. And this is particularly true for researcher um, innovation and public engagement. Um, but I think uh, just to uh, touch on what Yantina was saying about the lack of evidence for evidence-based policy, um, of course, uh, evidence-based uh, evidence is great for developing policies that will facilitate multi-stakeholder engagement. But I think in Africa, we have to take a step back from that and say we don't even have evidence to understand which stakeholders are involved in the knowledge and data creation landscape. Mm -hmm. We actually need physical numbers of who's doing what, uh, what spaces they're working in and, and who they're interacting with before we can actually start strategizing on how to get multi-stakeholder engagement. So I would actually be pushing for evidence at a much earlier stage to just understand who's populating the landscape before we can start thinking about multi-stakeholder engagement. Thanks. Thanks very much, Louise. It's an in, important point that you made just there. Um, Nizreen, um, over to you for any, any thoughts from your side. Uh, thank you. Uh, Louise, uh, Yanita, and Abby already emphasized the need for having culture of responsibility. The challenge of diffuse responsibility will result in new models of governing dual use research, particularly through augmented training and awareness to foster a culture of responsibility. We have some examples of initiative in this regard, uh, such as IGEM and uh, DAPRA Safe Gene Project, which includes the use of independent experts to help research co uh, consider LEADER, which stands for legal, ethical, environmental, dual use and responsible innovation issues. These are expected to be scaled up and enriched with regulation. On the other hand, many processes uh, driving heightened political concern about dual use research are international in its nature and involve diverse stakeholders spread across different countries and national jurisdictions like universities, research institutions, commercial labs, research funders, data banks, etc. Current efforts to govern this area tend to be reactive and are at best occurring when the respective national frameworks of particular countries where they exist, making a global approach uh, a little bit challenging. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks very much, Nizreen. And um, this time round, Cheng, I would like to give you the last word on this particular question. Yeah, for this, uh, thank you uh, for, for this question uh, very briefly. Uh, uh, I uh, certainly did. Here, I would like to just uh, echo what uh, your summary, Fripa just said, mentioned about the science review. I think uh, for regulated dual use technology in life science, I think uh, it is important to keep abreast of scientific breakthroughs in the uh, research and development landscape. I'm sorry, Jen, can we, um, just in the interest of time, um, perhaps we can move okay. on. I can ask the next question and perhaps there, there may be some way that you can um, look into your connection a little bit while we move on to the next question. Um, the final question I wanted to put to all of you was this issue of the different actors. You've all mentioned different actors and we've also heard several different actors, different groups being mentioned during the discussion yesterday and today as well. So from your, again, from your own experiences, from your own regional perspectives, do you have any ideas how these particular, you know, different stakeholders can be brought into governments? governance frameworks. What methods and tools and techniques have worked in, in other fields that you may have experience of? Um, I'm going to give the floor first to you, to, to um, Yantina. You already mentioned a couple of things, you know, from, from the African perspective, from your own experiences as well. Perhaps you'd like to elaborate a bit upon those as well. Thanks, Yantina, over to you. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so, so I think in response to this question, there, there really are there are two sub questions, right? Which is one one is how do you involve a broad range of stakeholders in the development of regulation? So, so is engagement an essential feature of how you come to develop regulations or regulatory perspectives? And then the second is how do you involve different stakeholders in its implementation? Right. So, once you have the governance instrument, how do you involve stakeholders? in making decisions about technology. And th there, there are several interesting examples that we can draw on. So I, I, I've mentioned the way that people have gone about 
um, developing regulation with regards to um, gene drive mosquitoes, in, mostly in West Africa. So that has involved a very broad process of, of, of regulation, both top down. So I mentioned the African Union, but there's also been a lot of kind of bottom up stakeholder engagement. Um, the, the in, in the gene gene editing space, there's there's other interesting proposals. So there's a, a team from Harvard who have spoken about or, or proposed that what we should do is is set up a global observatory, which is populated. So it's 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 a funded entity, um, and it's it's a it's it's a funded entity composed of different kinds of stakeholders with a vested interest, including members of the biohackers community, for instance, who who come together regularly to describe or to discuss. Um, technological advancement and their desirability and their ethical ethical challenges. There's also lots of different proposals that are coming up around setting up something like sector specific boards, um, either national or regional or, or possibly even global. So, so having global technolo technology specific uh, or sector specific overview boards that involve a broad range of stakeholders. Um, mandated to make decisions or provide guidance around technological applications but i think i think the key lesson for me or the key the key the key point for me is that none of these things will work if if they if they don't build on and extend existing instruments networks initiatives and tools so i think and and, and particularly because this is you know if we're talking the panel is about the innovations in the life sciences um there, I think it is it is key that dual use issues needs to be considered, need to be considered in 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 a wider range of issues, including the desirability of technological development, um, including its ethics, um, and and um, elements like that. Over to you. Excellent. Thank, thank, thanks very much, Antina, for that. Abby, over to you for any thoughts that you may have on on ways in which these um, stakeholders, you know, specific methods, tools, techniques that may have worked in other fields. You've already referred to to some things, but perhaps you have some other ideas too. Sure. Um, I guess I, I just want to, you know, like, since this is the last question before we open, I, I think a lot of the focus has been about, you know, sort of minimizing the risk um, and, and really looking at the nefarious potential of dual use. But the, the reality is also that the reason why, uh, you know, the, the global south and, you know, developing economies like Malaysia, you know, are really talking about, you know, really making it an innovation country in an innovative region. And so there is a lot of emphasis here. I mean, especially when we want to engage stakeholders. I know when we talk about science advice, you know, it's not just, you know, an advice, but it's more of a brokerage. You know, what is in it for me? And so I think one angle that I think as we, um, you know, rightfully, as as Sandina mentioned, you know, we got to look at this whole, you know, sort of more cohesively, comprehensively, holistically, uh, you know, call it what you may. Um, and but one area is also how can we maximize innovation, and this includes the economic benefits that it actually comes with that. Um, and then, you know, sort of also being aware of the risk. So at least from the experience for me, there are three things here that I think um, it's been successful in this region. Um, one is actually, um, you know, having this international dialogue. So I, I can't, ex, you know, sort of express how grateful I am for many of the initiatives of the US NAS, uh, also the BWC, because without that, you know, sort of, I guess, proof of concept, at least for in our region, to see that it works, it actually, you know, is addressed and it provides legitimacy. Um, you know, that always is helpful to build upon uh, to locally contextualize. The second one is also leveraging on key uh, 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 players in, in, in the country. So for example, identifying uh, top leaders to be engaged and also national academies, uh, that seem to be have um, you know, quite a, a positive impact uh, because especially academies, they have you know, two approaches. One is you know, to reach out to as many people, but they, are, they also have the year of the policy makers. And so um, really um, driving uh, the, the academies to play a, a bigger role, and this includes the young scientists and the networks uh, that they have. And, and, and third, I know it's cliche, but honestly, education, education, education. And the more we are able to locally contextualize uh, many of the instruments that are out there uh, to a local setting, um, and, and even a simple thing like case studies, we have found that just changing the name of the case studies to Malaysian names 
um, suddenly the students and the young scientists can relate to it so much more um, than if you had white actors. Excellent. Thanks very much, Abby. Um, I just want to check and see where things are with, with Cheng. Cheng, are you back online? Um, have you managed to dial in? I want to make a quote of the Director General of the UN Office, uh, uh, Tatiana Valavaya, uh, who uh, addressed the first uh, innovation dialogue last year in Geneva. The world we are living in today is more, we need to uh, strengthen in the uh, regime of the BWC. As I mentioned earlier, the CWC can provide confidence to the state's party is largely because of its well-designed uh, verification regime. I believe the PwC uh, review conference to be held next year is a very good opportunity to review all this science and technology development in life science and discuss among states parties on how to strengthen the PwC regime, uh, on how to establish the verification regime, code of conduct, etc. Second point, I would like to make engagement with all relevant stakeholders and gaining their support. Uh, can you click? Uh, during the stage of the negotiations of the CWC, uh, it was also not easy to get uh, bring chemical industry uh, who producing uh, dual use chemicals and the monitoring of the uh, uh, CWC. The two major concerns expressed by the chemical industry, A, is how to protect the chemical, uh, confidential business information. B is possible negative impact of uh, public relations of images uh, of their facility. Actually, uh, these two uh, expressed concerns has been resolved during the implement implementation phase. On the first issue, uh, actually during the first uh, review conference uh, in 2003 uh, of the CWC, uh, the report says the performance of the inspection teams during the conduct of inspections has recognized as being technically proficient and highly professional, with the inspection teams strictly following the inspection's mandate and the provisions of the convention. No incident of breach of confidentiality has ever occurred during the on-site inspection. Yeah, on the second concern of the uh, um, expressed by industry, regard to negative impact, the former director of verification of OPCW, he wrote in 2000, said the widespread apprehension that industry facilities receiving inspections from chemical weapons uh, inspectors and the chemical weapons convention might be damaged by adverse publicity has proved to be groundless in practice. OPCW inspectors routinely arrive at industry site, inspection them, and depart virtually unnoticed. Yeah, the third the point I like to make is about implementation. Well, both uh, deal with the internet body and the national implementation. So uh, uh, you can see this is the uh, implement. We implementing uh, international uh, each treaty need a very strong international implement implementation body. Compare CWC and BWC. You can easily see here. For OPCW, uh, they this year. Yeah, they have around uh, 70 million euros budget and uh, 450 uh, staff members. But for BWC, uh, Daniel, you know better than me, you only got uh, 1 million uh, this year, uh, well, for all these years, and only start including chief of you. So that's a big difference. For in national implementation, uh, I think the uh, uh, another point, uh, CWC, they uh, requires states party to build a national authority to support implementation. I think uh, this is also something uh, I, I try to make is uh, uh, about the science and technology review, which has a flip, uh, flip uh, for the science and review, uh, OPCW, uh, the scientific advisory board for development relevant to the CWC and uh, give the advice uh, to the direct general and the policymakers and uh, they keep informed all the development in science and technology relevant to the CWC. And also, in the OPCW has established a, a, a board of education uh, the, uh, advisory board. So uh, we need to keep constantly uh, keep in touch with the all stakeholders. In summary, I believe the, uh, to address the dual use of technology uh, in life science, uh, all Stakeholders should be brought into governance and an improved, I mentioned improved and enhanced uh, PwC regime to strengthen the international security. Back to you, Daniel. 
Thanks very much for that. Um, I'd like now to turn back to the. I had the list of um, speakers here. Louise, you were you were next on my list. So, would you like to address this question? Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, and I think I kind of follow on quite nicely from uh, Cheng because I have possibly the the direct opposite um, perspective on this. Um, I think it is very important to get the top down alignment and um, and rollout, but I. I also think it's very important to get the bottom up um, evidence and engagement. And I guess in answering this question, I'm drawing on my answers of the previous questions. Um, from an African perspective, I think the expectation misalignment, the lack of prior engagement with uh, researchers, and the lack of evidence about the challenges that they face creates the kind of uh, very difficult space in which to be confident that any regulations that are developed are actually implemented on the ground. And I think that what is critical at this juncture is to get qualitative and qualitative, uh, quantitative evidence that expose the challenges that uh, researchers might face in engaging with these um, with these policies on dual use. And I think um, to echo uh, everyone's uh, comments that education is vital in uh, making sure that this happens and uh, reaching out to the researchers to make sure not only that they understand uh, issues of dual use, but they, they feel that they're able to um, communicate concerns, uh, not only about dual use, but about um, how the policies are going to affect their research environments. Um, and I think uh, in terms of education, to echo what Avi was saying, that uh, locally appropriate education is the only way forward, because unless the researchers see value in uh, in the concept, um, they are not going to see value in the, the regulations that come out of it. And I think because of that, um, to link up to some comments you made in the previous session, but also Avi's comments, that. Um, it's very important to frame dual use compliance in terms of uh, positive responsibilities and excellence in innovation and research rather than just in punitive measures, because uh, that is the way to be able to develop the, the cultures of responsibility that everyone has been talking about um, in this session. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Louise. And uh, now I'd like to give the final word on this question. And before we move into the Q and A um, session, to to Nizreen. and Nizreen, if you could keep it fairly brief, so that we have enough time to address some of the questions that we've been receiving. Okay. Thanks, Nizreen. Okay. Over to you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, one of the tools is by increasing opportunities for participation of the life science community within the framework of the BTWC. The involvement of the life science community in the BTWC allows for promoting an increased understanding of the risk and benefit of science and technology. Equally, this process contributes to sensitizing life scientists about the relevance of the convention and the ways in which they can facilitate risk monitoring and assessment in order to prevent misuse. The mutually reinforcing nature of these activities is evident in the work of the OPD, OPCW that was mentioned by Chen, uh, the Scientific Advisory Board SAB and the OPCW Advisory Board on Education and Outreach, where scientists' engagement is considered a key priority for maintaining an international norm against chemical weapons. Similarly, the ninth review conference of the BTWC that is scheduled to take place in 2021 could consider and agree on measures and activities for strengthening the existing mechanism for engaging life science community with strengthening the convention. Regarding establishing a voluntary code of conduct on dual use risk management for the life science industry, it is very important to safeguard the bioeconomy and prevent the risk of misuse of bioeconomy outputs or entities. In this regard, life science industry is a key stakeholder in ensuring that dual use research is not accidentally or deliberately misused. As such, the industry can make a significant contribution in terms of capacity building, advocacy, and outreach in order to strengthen lab biosafety and biosecurity and prevent misuse. Strong incentives are needed to ensure that life science industry accepts biological security as an element of corporate social responsibility. The creation of new incentives to ensure parties beyond the researcher are active in risk management of dual use technologies is another tool. This could include committees that draw in representatives from the do-it-yourself by space, financial incentives for researchers to join by security consortia, and financial incentives to involve pharmaceutical companies 
and other commercial actors in the process of risk management. I will end up here. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nizreen. Um, okay, so I'd like to thank all of you for sharing your unique perspectives on these, these four questions that I posed to you. We're now going to open the floor for the remaining time for questions from our audience, and we've, we've received already some as well. Um, we have to finish actually in, in about eight minutes from now, in fact, to allow time to transition to the subsequent panel. I mean, it's quite important for me that we're on time as well as two of my kind of bosses are on the next panel. We've got Izumi Nakamitsu, um, the Undersecretary General for Disarmament Affairs at the UN and also Ambassador Mailu, who's the chairman of the, uh, meet, the BWC meeting of states parties this year. So I don't want to keep either of them waiting. So um, I'll look, we've received some questions in the chat box as you as you have all been talking. I probably won't have time and we won't have time to get to all of them, unfortunately. I'll just kind of throw out a couple of these questions and then any of you that want to answer, given that we don't have much time for, for each of you, so perhaps um, you'll, you'll each want to pick on some elements of these. We've got some questions about the need for verification with, within the BWC. Cheng has referred quite often to the OPCW um, way of doing things and the model there, so perhaps some others want to touch on that as well. There's also a specific question as to whether it would make sense to merge the biological and chemical weapons conventions, but if, if that's not possible, then how do we generate the necessary synergies between them and other relevant regimes? A question on current developments and, you know, the coronavirus, has that given impetus for academia to play a greater role within the BWC? And then also another question on um, transparency within national um, military biodefense programs, particularly those um, programs which may be taking place in, in other countries around the world as well, besides those where they're actually um, controlled from. So could I throw any of those questions over to you and then I'll just ask you one by one and you can pick which which of those questions you want to um, you want to address. So um, Louise to you first. Well, thanks Daniel. Um, I'm actually going to pick the last question by TT Salvam um, about innovations not being covered by regulations. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot of very um, innovative uh, frameworks for guiding responsible research and innovation that are coming out at the moment that are being rolled out by um, by governments, but also by educational institutions to train people to do responsible research and innovation. And I thought for a long time that it is a, a very interesting space to try and introduce dual use and biosecurity issues um, to try and train innovators as they um, as they start up uh, about these issues so that it's integrated into their design thinking and they're uh, thinking about product rollout. So I guess that would be my uh, my comment on that question. Okay, thanks, and thanks for spotting that question. Came in just after I was summarising the the other questions as well. Um, Nizreen, over to you. Did you want to pick from one of the questions that I mentioned? No, the question regarding COVID nineteen, and you know how can we get involved uh, the academic sector and other researchers regarding best practices and. Uh, the issue of maybe uh, misuse of, uh, you know, new advances and the use of the virus and now the development of vaccine. Uh, I'd like to mention a, a, an initiative that is uh, recently implemented in my region, in the Middle East and North Africa region. It was called uh, Biochem, and also here we like, you know, connect the biosecurity and chemical safety and security. It's Biochem uh, Compass. It is a platform for enhancing best practices among scientists in the region, inside the lab and outside the lab in the field. So, uh, uh, including uh, uh, these initiatives are, you know, we have many researchers from all around the region with different, you know, backgrounds. And uh, since uh, the COVID-19, uh, we establish and initiate a series of uh, webinars where we can enhance best practices and the uh, uh, use of this uh, new virus and emerging viruses uh, within the region. Also another, you know, the project that I'm really involved in and also a network that it is uh, uh, tackling research in the West Asia is regarding, you know, uh, surveillance of coronaviruses in bats uh, among different uh, countries in the region. So there are a number of initiatives which are really conducting in the region regarding, you know, best practices 
uh, to prevent misuse of chemical and biological uh, pathogens and agents, and at the same time, enhance best practices uh, among researchers. Thank okay, you. thanks. Thanks very much, Nizreen. Abi, are there any particular um, reflections you'd like to give to any of the questions? I'm looking through these questions and I'm like, oh my God, if there was an evidence that you needed uh, for the need for multi-stakeholder engagement, you know, to actually identify the right questions to be addressed, that's exactly that. I mean, I suddenly realized that, you know, there were so many things that we didn't cover in that last one hour um, that is, you know, sort of out there. Uh, I guess I will choose, uh, you know, a question by Cornell, um, which is how much awareness is there within the pharmaceutical industry of the potential risk associated with nano delivery. Um, so I think um, there's actually very little discourse, um, at least within this region. And you know, when you talk about a lot of research on developing new nano drugs, um, most of the typical assessments are your basic um, toxic toxicity studies that I am afraid uh, may not be able to accurately assess the, the long-term, if not the short-term effects of uh, that. And to build on that, uh, what Nazreen said, I think, um, you know, the whole COVID-19 situation, I mean, I don't think it's not only the academic society, but actually, you know, there are many more players that needs to be done. What's evident is that even the knowledge base is not as certain as what science likes it to be. Uh, and, and therefore, um, you know, we find at least in this region, there are more media, you know, coverage on what scientists think, um, you know, and, and, and hopefully, um, you know, more players can come together so that we become more comforted by the uncertainties of science. Excellent. Thanks very much, Abi. Um, Cheng, over to you. Hopefully you can still hear me and we can hear you this time. Um, Cheng, any final thoughts from you in response to any of these questions? Okay, uh, Daniel. The, um, I'll just pick up the uh, two questions. One is re related to the verification and uh, the other is a merge of the CWC, PWC. Well, for verification, uh, I personally, based on the CWC experience, I believe the uh, verification regime or ma maximum can uh, give the confidence of state's parties. Therefore, I fully uh, support the PWC next year could uh, continue in this direction. With regard to the uh, PWC merge of the PW uh, CWC, well, it's up to the policymakers how to make it in the end. But uh, uh, my personally believe the B, uh, CWC have lots of experience can be shared by BWC. So this also uh, needs uh, future policymakers to consider. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Cheng. Um, Tina, I see you messaged and said you've, um, but is there anything, any final thoughts from, from your side you'd like to add? No, just to say thanks so much. So obviously, uh, re recognizing Abi's point that there, there is so much to discuss and so much we didn't um, even speak about. But thanks very much um, for your for your chairing of the panel, uh, Daniel. You're, you're welcome. No problem. Thanks to you, you and Tina and thanks to all the other panelists as well. It's been a really interesting discussion. I hope it's been interesting for those those in the audience as well. And I hope we have kind of served the, the, the mission that we were given by Giacomo um, to kind of transition and to start, you know, taking what was discussed in the, the tech panels and to start, you know, thinking about that in terms of governance, particularly in terms of governance gaps as well. I've certainly heard a lot from, from all five of you about, you know, the ways in which it exists existing instruments can be strengthened and uh, adapted to deal with these new challenges, but also the, you know, um, and very good, very concrete ideas from you about particular stakeholders and ways to involve um, particular stakeholders. And very glad, very grateful that you each address these issues from your own particular regions as well and spoke about particular initiatives, be it in, in the ASEAN region or in Africa as well. So thanks, thanks very much to you all for doing that. Um, I realize, as I said, I need to finish by 12.50. I'm looking at 12.51, so hopefully that doesn't impact too much on the on the subsequent panel. But I'll, I'll thank you all again. Thanks to everyone for listening. Apologies if I didn't get a chance to answer and address all of the questions, but thanks for your time, attention, and all of the questions. I'll pass back to um, Giacomo now for moving on to the next panel. Giacomo, over to you. Thanks again. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, thank you to uh, all of the great speakers in the panel that just concluded. It was uh, fascinating to hear about the range of different perspectives and lessons uh, that can, you know, can be brought to uh, the issue of how do we improve governance 
framework around dual use technologies in life sciences. The last panel of the day, which is going to be a very high level panel uh, that will look at how we can bring everything back uh, at the UN and multilateral level. How can we bring all of the insights that we've heard in the last couple of days in action within multilateral agendas? Welcome back, everyone, to uh, this, the final panel of our uh, Innovations Dialogue. And we're going to be wrapping up this session with, and indeed the last couple of days, with what we hope will be a fabulous discussion on really trying to say, how do we bring the multi, all the discussions we've been discussing about new technologies and their implications for arms control, for risks, for security in a broader sense of the term than we, perhaps we've understood before. But moving that now into what does that mean for uh, multilateral governance uh, and in particularly in the area of arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. You see that we have a great panel before us and a panel that uh, brings with it an enormous amount of experience of different multilateral bodies and different multilateral disarmament and arms control processes. So I'm not going to spend too much time introducing them, but just to welcome and say how happy we are to have Ambassador uh, uh, Maria Teresa Almoela, Isa with us. Uh, Under Secretary, High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Uzumi Nakamitsu, uh, from joining us from the States, and Ambassador Cleopa Kilonzo Mailu, permanent representative to uh, here from Kenya in Geneva, but also our uh, esteemed and incoming chair of the BWC. So great to have you here. Now, we have been exploring. Uh, developments in technology and advances in science in specifically the area of life sciences over the past couple of days. But of course, I think it's important that we bear and keep in mind and be framed. Technology and the regulation of weapons have always been linked. Technology and advances in science and technology have driven the way we think about war, the way we develop weapons, they've driven how we even think of weapons and war. But they've also helped and technology has really made considerable advances to how we undertake arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament. The technology has strengthened our ability to think about transparency, strengthened our means for information sharing and strengthened our means for verification. And we, so that can be all critical to helping to build trust. So I think it's important that we place the developments in the life sciences that we're seeing at this moment in time in this bigger context and be, uh, remind ourselves that we're really trying to find this balance in how we respond and how we draw on science and technologies. That being said, and even though we talk about this long history of the relationship between tech and arms control, we are sensing, and I think we've explored this uh, a lot, it's come up in the conversations today, that we have some fundamentally new moments and crossroads where we find ourselves with the pace of technological change, particularly in the life sciences and the expansion that it re represents for our thinking, our concept of security, as well as security threats uh, and challenges. So how can the multilateral arms control and disarmament machinery adapt? And do we need fundamentally new approaches or can we build on what we have? So Izumi, to, to get us started on this question, and I know it's one that you've been thinking about a lot, maybe asking you, how can the UN help this current moment and, and to help think about the arms control and disarmament infrastructure to address these new tech challenges of today? Is there something that the UN can do to encourage this very traditional, formal, state-based system that we've built to really begin to think about uh, and incorporate advances in the life sciences in the way we work? Over to you, Azumi. Thank you. Good morning from the United States. Um, it's early in the morning, but I did follow just a bit of the previous discussion. Um, Congratulations, uh, first of all, to UNIDEA for organizing a very stimulating discussion. Uh, I think this is exactly the kind of discussions that we need to have today. Now, as you said, um, I think we are really um, looking at a, a very new situation. Uh, one uh, additional point that I wanted to put uh, why um, the, you know, uh, the technological development, uh, life science, etc., is so um, different, if you will, today, 
is also because it's it, it's happening at the conversions of other kinds of technologies. Um, there are several developments also outside of um, uh, science and technology, um, including globalization, uh, the, the, the revolution in information technology and climate change and all these things. So, so we need to actually look at those issues, uh, technological evolution and, and life science in a broader context of everything that is um, happening around us. Uh, and therefore, we need to actually uh, take into those broader developments when assessing risks and the impact um, of those developments on arms control, non-proliferation and, and disarmament. Um, and uh, one of those things that is very important, I think, is uh, a do-it-yourself um, um, biology. Uh, I know you've discussed this. Uh, I'm now going to obviously summarize the discussions that you, you must have been having. Um, and, and the reason why I, I mentioned this is um, this is also the aspiration to democratize science. Access to science is really uh, changing. Um, it's much beyond uh, sort of large uh, laboratories, etc. And that means who needs, you know, that, that means that there is an implication on who needs to be uh, involved in the discussions on those issues. Um, why am I saying that? Obviously, because the United Nations is an intergovernmental uh, platform uh, and we are very used to having intergovernmental discussions, dialogues and negotiations. But that actually has to change now and we're beginning to see uh, new approaches in, in uh, having conversations on these issues. Now, um, we obviously need to take a, um, a fresh and comprehensive look at our approaches to all sorts of uh, um, arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. And, and the Secretary General actually has been saying that the current circumstances call for a new vision for disarmament and arms control and non-proliferation, um, which means that we need to uh, take into account all sorts of weapons, enhance transparency about new weapon systems, seeking to restrict or prohibit those deemed destabilizing. We have been, the international community or, or human society, I should say, have definitely been um, working for many centuries, in fact, um, regulating new technologies, uh, trying to make sure um, that we um, minimize the negative impact of new science and new technologies. Uh, but we have been also um, rather reactive uh, in this work. Um, what number one thing that we need to do is that we also need to now uh, start predicting and understanding future implications. And this is rather difficult because we are actually looking at what we don't know, what we don't have at the moment. Um, we, um, this would mean that um, scientists themselves needs to be part of this conversation. Um, this would mean that um, all sorts of new stakeholders, it's, it's a little bit of a catchphrase, uh, multi-stakeholder, uh, but new uh, types of stakeholders beyond governments uh, will need to, to be involved in this conversation. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is very uh, clear uh, from the outset. Now, for the UN, you asked about uh, United Nations and what might be the role that we could play. Um, we do have um, um, a unique convening power. I would definitely like to believe that we still have a legitimacy in convening various stakeholders. Uh, and, and therefore, we can be a platform for states and other stakeholders to engage in sincere and, and serious dialogue that can really stimulate new thinking about disarmament, uh, think, thinking out of the box. Um, and I think that's uh, what we need to have. Now, we all know that disarmament machinery is definitely not perfect, uh, far from it. Um, we've been having a lot of uh, challenges in, in many years now. Um, but when negotiations and, and actual sort of uh, agreements would be very difficult in the current uh, um, international context, uh, deliberations in um, different processes that we can still um, create. Um, Open-ended working group is one, group of governmental experts is another. Uh, those are the bodies that will be quite useful still. 
uh, to deliberate on new challenges and identify what might be the key issues that governments, as well as others, need to actually uh, put their heads together and, and discuss. I want to pass on uh, to the theme that you raised about bringing scientists in to, to Ambassador uh, Mailu. But if I can just flag something that I think you, you, you have raised, and I think we'll come back to this a little bit, the idea of a platform, the idea of having some sort of convening deliberation that looks forward and more predictive discussions, given how often when we engage in the intergovernmental forum, we're, we're a little bit, we don't go beyond what we know and where we are. So I think that's a really intriguing notion, if that's indeed possible. So I'll probably come back to you on that. But if I may, Ambassador Mailu, Izumi led the call saying scientists need to be part of the conversation uh, uh, to help us anticipate uh, perhaps in a little bit more than we did and think about the, the structures and the frameworks for, for the implications of new technologies and how we think about them are sufficiently early on in a governance, weapons governance process. This isn't new to the BWC. There's been long-standing discussions about establishing a process for reviewing science and technology, technological developments uh, that could be relevant to the BWC. What do you see as, as the potential uh, for such a review to be institutionalized in the BWC, and what would you see that added value as? First of all, uh, thank you so much, Renata, for organizing this meeting. and. Um, to discuss a very important uh, issue. And uh, secondly, let me thank the Under Secretary General for the support we continue as BWC to receive from the Secretariat uh, uh, ISU support unit. Uh, turning to, 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 to the question, first of all, let me contextualize the work of BWC in, in a sense that um, BWC uh, understands that uh, science will bring uh, and will continue to bring immense developments of benefit to, to humankind. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, right from the inception, BWC uh, was conceptualized as uh, an instrument or a convention which would be able to guard against uh, biological weapons and hence as science develops, then the work of the BWC becomes very important in mitigating the risks uh, which are attendant to that uh, rapid development in science and technology. And therefore, the task or the role of BWC has continued to become a balancing act between encouraging, uh, protecting, and sharing the benefits of science, while at the same time preventing any potential risks which might emerge out of that. And therefore, uh, BWC cannot work without the input of scientists. And therefore, the arrangement which has developed over a period of 45 years within the BWC of meetings of both state parties and also meetings of experts on different thematic areas continues to address some of these issues. And specifically, how do we look at science and technology development? And how does that input to the work of BWC? Therefore, we know that within the meeting of experts, uh, there is a, a cluster which discusses science and technology. And at the same time, as you have said, Renata, the issue of institutionalization of this development within the BWC become key. And within that, we have a class which discusses institutional strengthening of the BWC, taking into consideration the various aspects of science and technology development and how these can be harnessed for potential good and at the same time prevent uh, humanity from the attendant risks. And therefore, to contextualize this work, let's look at the current situation we find ourselves in of the global COVID-19 pandemic, which is very critical at this moment. It has brought out four issues. One, it reinforces the relevance of the BWC work, which was set 45 years ago. 
Two, it brings to the fore the complexity of the task which lies, lies ahead for BWC, and therefore makes states parties rethink the engagement we are going to have going forward. And three, it also reaffirms the urgency in pursuing a collaborative approach in dealing with these issues, because um, state parties must engage in a meaningful manner in order to forge ahead in some of the issues we have been discussing for the last 45 years, which have not yielded any benefits, especially the issues of verification, compliance to reporting, which gives comfort to countries that what is happening within other countries protects them. And lastly, it has also demonstrated international to the international community the possible impact of deliberate, if not natural cause, of um, uh, biological attack within the, the global community. It has shown that it can be devastating particularly if it is targeted. And therefore, I want to believe going forward, the work of BWC informed by the current pandemic will be re-energized within the next, in December, when we discuss the meet, in the meetings of experts, what we need to do. And then when we come to the MSP in April, then clear decisions must be made to inform our review conference which will be coming later in the year, which is the decision-making body of the BWC. Therefore, there's a case here for us to be able to rethink, for us to be able to contextualize the events which have taken place and be able as member states to rethink how we are going to discuss and put in place certain institutional framework and how we bring science to bear to inform the work of BWC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Malu. And that's no small feat. So we will, we will all be wishing you the very best of luck in, in, in that exercise and accompanying that with you. Issa, moving to you, I mean, over the last couple of days now, we've been discussing lots of interesting, innovative examples of collaboration across scientific sectors between professional and what Izumi called the DIY uh, science sector. We talk about public-private partnerships, talk about international cooperation. What can we do to build uh, collaboration and cooperation in uh, the multilateral frameworks of arms control and disarmament where that might help us maximize and take advantage of the existing developments in life sciences, but mitigate also the risks? Do you see any opportunities in particular? Um, yes, uh, and I also thank you for inviting me to be part in this discussion. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we we look at uh, advances in science uh, from three vantage points: their peaceful uses and the non-discriminatory access of um, states to these benefits, the security risk, and number three, how we manage those risks. Um, and to be effective in our mandate. Uh, it's been established that we need to examine processes and assumptions behind these processes for us to be able to uh, effectively carry out this mandate. And I think it's been very clear during the past uh, uh, panels that uh, our work is only one part of future building. You know, this big endeavor of looking at technology and science policy. Uh, being at the heart of uh, uh, growth in the knowledge economy. And uh, this compels uh, us to um, work successfully within a landscape where there are different actors, public and private, that each have their own authorities and hierarchies. And these hierarchies are more flat and horizontal compared to the to the higher hierarchies that we are familiar with in the traditional policy making uh, regimes. And this is something that we should be uh, uh, considering in designing, uh, considering new instruments. Because to establish practices in multilater multilateralism presupposes the centrality of a states and national interests, both in the conversation and the policy making processes. 
And therefore, um, we need to realize that we need to engage uh, deeply in this complex, multi-level, highly networked ecosystems that already thrive on uh, different forms of governance mechanisms that are organic to them. And um, what I mean is um, some of the most powerful governance instruments in the life sciences are actually embedded in uh, corporate policies, industry standards, uh, research or data sharing protocols. And uh, these are very powerful and precise, mainly because they derive from the expertise, the knowledge and data sets available to these institutions, to these entities. And therefore, our approaches to governance should be able to leverage uh, this web of instruments of self-regulation uh, as they end their interface with the more formal public regulation. Uh, also, um, we've heard much about uh, the need to look at um, emerging technologies uh, from the point of view of their correlation with each other, uh, recognizing that these convergences um, Ampli amplify and complicate the risk that we face in the security environment. And, but they also reframe the options for us uh, to design a robust uh, and uh, responsive and adaptive governance architecture that works for the technology system. So our new uh, approaches benefit from practices that we see where you have interdisciplinary and multi-stakeholder uh, approaches. And I would cite the example of the World Health Organization, for example, uh, in leading the way in um, designing initiatives that involve uh, a wide range of stakeholders. And we're talking about CEPI, we're talking about Gavi. And just last year, um, the World Health Organization uh, has finalized, and I think it was able to launch this year, an initiative uh, called the um, EpiBrain, which is a sustainable, shared, and accessible data innovation environment to reduce the impact of infectious disease outbreaks through forecasting and predictive analysis. We also must um, uh, Consider, we must recall that some of the most powerful instruments of um, um, governance, industry standards, and their compliance mechanisms were outcomes of um, negotiations that involve state and non state actors. So we do have these um, uh, practices, participatory and collaborative, that could serve as reference points for us to move forward in developing uh, policy for developed uh, technology systems. Uh, finally, I think it's important for us to re-examine uh, uh, the, the processes that we have and recognize that these were designed uh, after the Cold War. These were imagined during the Cold War, and they should be suited to uh, current uh, realities where you have a more dynamic and multipolar uh, world order. And you have, we have uh, a broad range of actors in industry and the academia that have, uh, that are autonomous and are also aware of their responsibilities. And of course, the vital role of um, uh, civil society and the public in the discourse. We need to appreciate that uh, 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 the, these, structures were designed when states led innovation, when they took primary responsibility for the risk and the management of the risk inherent in these technology systems. And uh, the situation is not the same anymore. Thanks, thanks, Isa. And I hear a real consistency across your various points about how do we think about a more inclusive, democratic, you talked about networked, space is uh, if we're going to find uh, solutions and approaches to the challenges we face in the life sciences and harnessing the good and minimizing the bad. 
I also hear you all talk about complexity and convergence, and Izumi also talked about the need to frame uh, these develops in developments, even as we bring together public health with security and weapons regulation, that we also need to think about broader trends of climate change, mass migration, globalization. And so at a certain point, I guess the tension is how do we address everything, but actually make progress on specific issues. And, and, and therein, I think, uh, lies the rub. And maybe, Zumi, turning to you, if we do recognize just how complex that environment is and, and how many actors need to be part of discussions, perhaps, as Issa says, not necessarily in a hierarchical structures anymore, this is all happening at a time of a huge public health crisis and a huge economic crisis, and one that is likely, both of which are likely to accompany us for at least uh, the next few years, at a moment of significant polarization uh, between uh, states and regions in the world. In that really challenging context, what should be the priorities? What do we focus on, on first? Well, that's a difficult question. I mean, you know, it's, it's very difficult to strike a priority. Um, let me put it this way. I think the priority seen from the United Nations is number one, that we um, always keep our focus on human dimensions. Uh, we need to, to make sure that the current crises, and, and there are various uh, crises, uh, will not uh, continue to, um, you know, widen the disparity and in, in, in inequality. Um, we need to focus more on human security dimensions, um, and um, and thereby, uh, hopefully, we will be able to help at least restore trust of people um, in um, multilateralism, in uh, institutions, including multilateral institutions. Um, uh, you know, you, you said that the crisis will, will continue at least for a few years. It could be longer. So the, the, the process ahead of us will be a very difficult one. But if we stay focused on always looking at uh, what we need to protect, and, and that is the human dimensions of, of this crisis. And I hope that uh, the UN, you know, one of the, the also unique characteristics of the United Nations is that it's a system we actually do uh, tackle all those dimensions. Uh, we have capacities within the United Nations systems, and, and therefore we actually do have capacities to actually look at those wider and, and really broader uh, issues, and within it, uh, uh, disarmament and, and non-proliferation arms control. So, you know, we really need to be able to connect those security issues much more um, squarely with the human dimensions, um, including public health, et cetera. Thanks, Izumi. And I think really to that extent, the COVID crisis really is a crossroads for the arms control and the disarmament multilateral frameworks, precisely because it offers and brings into much more public attention in the eye what was perhaps in the past seen as a fairly esoteric and highly technical and specialized world. Everybody is listening and reading now, whether about vaccine research, about uh, exchanges, about public health challenges. And that really brings me, uh, perhaps, Ambassador Milo, to you. Um, if, there, if we are in this moment of thinking about the need to prioritize and urgency, what can the BWC Review Conference uh, do to perhaps engage stakeholders a little bit more actively, a broader range of stakeholders, scientific communities, the, uh, academic institutions, the private sector, to, to increase the visibility and, and relevance of the BWC, as you said, ahead of these very important meetings of the state parties and, and, the, and the member states discussions next year? Thank you. Thank you, Renata. As um, we engage in the work of the BWC, I think it is important to recognize that Article 12 of the Convention actually does state that um, the review conference shall take into account any scientific and technological developments relevant to the work of the Convention. And the word, key word is shall, and therefore we continue to be informed by science and developments in the decisions which we make. And therefore, as the wisdom of having the meeting of experts before the meeting of state parties, which is very important to be to inform the meeting of the state parties, 
And I want to say there are provisions for participation, wide participation from capitals and across the continent in terms of input. And therefore, the work of experts is not short of expertise, both from the uh, traditional science and also specific areas which we consider important for the BWC. Therefore, as we look forward uh, as B BWC, uh, the pro priority now is to substantively prepare for the ninth review conference, which is a body which makes decisions what will happen in the next five years. And I must say, because the review of uh, within the BWC was taking place every five years, wisdom prevailed in the sense that now we have annual meetings of experts so that we keep tab and we keep in speed with the developments in science and technology. Because five years is a long time to come and review what has happened. And therefore, that is a strong point. And therefore, we want to encourage uh, common interests and proposals to be submitted uh, across regional initiatives so that we can be able to discuss this in the MSP and in the review conference. Secondly, we want to believe that the decisions we are going to make uh, during the review conference are going to safeguard the relevancy of the BWC in coming years. And this, I think, has been shown by what we are experiencing now, the idea of strengthening and improve, improving our mechanisms for reviewing development has to be put in place and contextualized, which is very important going forward. And therefore, we want to strengthen the activities to promote peace, uh, peaceful uses of biology and foster international cooperation. As you can see, the developments in science are happening very rapidly. And therefore, the discussions we undertake within the BWC should be able to give countries the opportunity to access science and technology, technological developments, while at the same time, as BWC trying to mitigate the implications of adverse effects or any risks, risks which might come. And therefore, the last point which we want to focus on going forward is institutional strengthening. We know the inherent weaknesses within the BWC architecture. We know member states' feelings about certain structures being put in place, especially those which call into account for countries to be able to report and be also able to control and share information to give countries comfort. This is an area we would like to pursue during the next meetings and uh, uh, the prep co conference so that going to the ninth review conference, decisions can be made which will position and continue to give strength to BWC and wider acceptance and participation of uh, member states into this important um, uh, convention. And I want to believe, uh, lastly, uh, the events which have taken place will be a wake-up call to all of us to reach conclusions on some of the long outstanding issues within the BWC so that humanity can be guaranteed that the convention can actually safeguard the interests or can safeguard the population against adverse effects of developments in science and technology while at the same time embracing the good side of uh, biotechnology. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and thank you for, for flagging the sort of Thank the wake-up call that, in a way, uh, COVID and the public health crisis that we now have really presents for uh, for the intergovernmental frameworks and systems. And the question is, it is very clear that the multilateral system struggles to keep pace with technological innovation. But how can we reach at least some, make advance some progress in governance, uh, dynamics, frameworks, processes, and tools to help us at least anticipate, as Izumi said, and look a little bit forward to regulating current uh, processes in a way that, and I liked very much the point that you and Issa both said, that should also support equitable access of all states to technologies that can help their people and their communities and, and their own national security. 
Uh, Issa, I'm going to uh, put you on the spot as 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 one of the the the, the braver uh, a brave uh, member of our community. Uh, we just have had a, some questions are come, beginning to come in, and I think given your your work uh, to date in the BWC, you might be well placed to give this one a go. But also Izumi and uh, Ambassador Mali, feel free to uh, join in on this. But a question. Um, there is a call for some that we need to uh, differentiate biodefense, biosecurity, and biosafety, if indeed that's feasible, and how can how can that be done? But but really, the question is, what are the BWC and the WHO roles, and should they continue to be very separated and work in silos, or should we try to find ways, to, or how do we try to find ways for the BWC and the WHO to, to work together? Well, I think the, this question is very much at the heart of uh, some of the suggestions raised in the past panels about the need to consider um, learning from the success of the initiatives uh, of part, for participatory policymaking uh, across sectors and disciplines, because um, there are governance structures existing for certain technology systems that are translatable to other contexts. Often we, we expend so so much resources for you know imagining the brick and mortar details of you know new governance mechanisms when in fact. These, uh, these issues have been worked out elsewhere. And I think this is the point of uh, this question. Why can't we translate and you know, upscale? And often we, we try to, uh, in our you know, separate world, separate uh, milieu, we try to unpack conundrums in science and technology policy that have been resolved elsewhere. And um, sometimes we don't have to reinvent the wheel and, um, for example, uh, if we find that policies are scalable or, or transferable across disciplines, I think the heart of, of our, our challenge in the BWC when it comes to looking at science and uh, the, the speed at which uh, technology in biosciences are diffusing is that um, how are we able to translate the technology talk to a politically sound action agenda, because um, uh, we we do have uh, some problems about you know some problems about harnessing uh, the knowledge that we are able to generate from the processes where we involve scientists and experts, and to translate them to practical solutions. Uh, to gaps in governance that multilateralism is expected to cover. Um, uh, it's important, I think, to look at technology systems rather than specific, you know, uh, specific uh, and isolated developments that are running in, in on their own. And it's it's uh, important for us to look at governance models that are more robust and that allows innovation innovative spaces. And I think the models that we see in some economies where you have policy laboratories, innovation hubs, um, and pilots, they show us the way, uh, a way of um, promoting the upscaling of uh, technologies, but at the same time, it provides a very dynamic environment for uh, policy experimenting with uh, policies. Uh, and uh, these are models and templates that we can upscale and probably possibly translate in the in the fields where we individually operate. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa, for that. Izumi, uh, you talked about uh, the UN being a large system and a large framework that, that allows for perhaps exchanges uh, across many issues and more interdisciplinary uh, dialogues, more disciplinary actions, which is, I think, at the heart of this. Um, is that something that you see happening as you, from your vantage point as the high representative for disarmament uh, issues and affairs? 
Do you see the, your liaisons with WHO and other key health actors growing in the field? Yeah, um, let me um, say that, of course, the UN system has always been suffering from a, a rather siloed uh, a, a way of working. Uh, but that's exactly the point that the Secretary General really wants to address and, and, and so that we will be able to work and, and cooperate and coordinate in a more coherent, more strategic manner. Um, so that has been also one of my priority agenda. Um, you know, if you remember the Secretary General's agenda for disarmament was really also about making sure that disarmament operates or, or works in conjunction with all sorts of other priority agenda of the United Nations system. So breaking the silo is definitely a, a key and we have been uh, making serious efforts to tackle that issue. But one, one more thing that I want to actually put here, um, you know, in the um, a current um, very complicated and complex environment with all sorts of challenging agenda in front of us, I, I think we really need to uh, make sure that, that the UN will have, um, if you will, a thought leadership uh, role. Uh, and also, um, if I could put it this way, a, a bit of a strategic coordination role or orchestration role. Uh, bringing together different communities, both in terms of stakeholders, but also uh, in terms of a substantive uh, areas and also various actions that we need to take. Um, one of which uh, I mentioned is, is a convening role, uh, but there are also um, role that we need to take uh, in terms of initiating and supporting really all sorts of different actions. I mean, research um, that you are doing is one, one very important because after all, we are dealing with a, a very new and emerging uh, challenges in front of our eyes. So we need to equip ourselves with better understanding, analysis, knowledge, et cetera. Um, and making those various you know, results from various actions available for uh, member states uh, and states in general um, and bring them together uh, so that uh, international community multilateral actions can be, um, you know, undertaken with a more, you know, a better sort of information, data and understanding and analysis. So all of these, I think, is a really important role that the UN has to take uh, in the 21st century. UN is not an entity that we can say member states do this. It just doesn't work like that. But still, we can do a, a lot of very important actions that will be really helpful uh, in the current uh, very complex environment. And, and that's a thought leadership or strategic coordination role. Thanks, Izumi. And I think maybe just it's also worth us reflecting. There's often uh, a lot of frustration at the inefficiencies of interstate. One of the comments that we've received from the chat is this idea, the never ending series of meetings and we can't do meetings now and the formality of the diplomatic world. But I think it's also worth us reflecting about the inclusiveness of the UN system in terms of states involved and the trade-offs between inclusiveness and an equitable in a, and equity. And then of course, the, the, the issues around uh, efficiencies of decision-making and of processes. And I think the what we see in science and technology is that it's borderless and knows no borders in terms of, uh, of engaging a wider sense of people. So I'm going to throw out two questions uh, in, in to the panelists in closing. Issa, I'll give it to you first, and then uh, if, if anyone wants to chip in, Ambassador Mailu or Izumi. Uh, one is, you know, this formality, this constant set of meetings and the review cycles every five years and the, and the let's say, the stately dance that is uh, international diplomacy as designed from the 18th century. In the context of the BWC, is, what are there options that we could think about overcoming the structural weaknesses of the architecture, uh, whether and taking advantage of online meetings, reviews, postings, ways in which we can accelerate or perhaps um, facilitate more efficient uh, decision-making deliberations and discussions is one that has come in from, from a set of questions. But also from uh, something that you mentioned is uh, public. How do we continue to demonstrate the relevance 
of uh, our multilateral governance frameworks in arms control, disarmament, and human security in its broadest sense? And how do we think about engaging uh, civil society and, and broader public communities in, in some of those discussions? So two small questions, of course, uh, to, to wrap up not questions that are only in the arms control and disarmament community uh, alone. There are these much broader questions at the heart of our multilateral uh, endeavour. Uh, but maybe, Issa, I'll start with you, and then if any uh, final comments or closing that Azumi or Ambassador Maidu would like to uh, share with us. Well, I agree with the point that the UN's relevance in the 21st century will rest very much on it uh, being an effective internal theater of public interest and in pursuing uh, security as a public good, as a public good in this age of innovation and uh, scientific revolution. Um, as said earlier, we are operating in a different and complex environment where there are different actors where the risk and responsibilities are, are spread across all of these actors. And I would like to cite that um, we can leverage two important factors in you know, pursuing compelling, uh, more decisive action. And at this time, especially, um, and one is that all of these actors have a collective interest in the predictability and stability of any global regime that will help us navigate the security challenges in this age of tech technological revolution. The second is that whether you're in the industry or academia, government, this, uh, the, this laboratories, any part of the epistemic community that we have uh, interfaced with in the, this dialogue, we each have accountability and we all uh, thrive on the currency of public trust. And this is why going to the point where you, you, uh, you cited the role of the public. The public must be engaged very uh, actively in this conversation because publics that appreciate, you know, their skin in the game in all aspects of technology governance are, um, are better shepherds, are better advocates and uh, guardians of uh, public interest and will keep us all on the ball and not going in divergent directions and not uh, being stuck in inertia. And uh, I would like to uh, cite that often uh, it's the public interest and public opinion that creates the fulcrum for uh, you know creating that demand for a more robust, more responsive, more adaptive governance of technology systems. Um, uh, and sometimes they spur action where parties have already become used to the industry leading uh, rules making ahead of states, right? So we have, we have accepted this as givens, but the public sector, uh, uh, a vigorous public engagement will, um, will probably change that. And, um, and here we want to cite the importance of uh, education, because in the age of information and fake news, it's important the scientists have their own uh, platforms for engaging the public, because um, um, they should be able to intelligently take part in our conversation and in the, in the governance processes uh, as watchdogs, as experts, as uh, people with major stakes in, in the designs of our governance systems. And this is, um, I think, not just, the conversation is not just about democratizing the, uh, the exercise, the activities of science and innovation, or the access to their benefits, but democratizing um, knowledge to enable our publics to, to take part and help create that demand for a more decisive action on our part. Thank you. Thanks so much, Isa. And thank you for making the point that public attention is not just part of a democratic process, but also drives a whole set of other factors. 
it drives political engagement, it drives resources, it drives uh, innovation and attention. So I think that's a, a critical point. Izumi, uh, Ambassador Milu, any final thoughts from you um, that you would like to make? Ambassador Milu, I well, see your microphone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Renata. Uh, let me just uh, revisit the issue of um, uh, going forward and this idea of collaboration between uh, not only UN agencies or, or agencies working together. In a sense, it is evident that working in silos going forward is not helpful. And therefore, we have seen both internationally, regionally, and at the national level, governments trying to bring agencies together to fight COVID-19. And in essence, that the lesson we learn is that is what we should have been doing, uh, working together across the di diverse expertise to be able to take agenda of countries and the international agenda forward. And therefore, it's not only BWC and WHO, any other organization, we must quickly think how, how we work across the divide to be able to be ready. We have been shown that the world was not ready for a pandemic in the 21st century. Having the experience we have right from the 18th century, 19th century pandemics, which have afflicted the world. And therefore, that is a big lesson which we need uh, to take forward. I think um, as, as far as uh, the UN system and our meetings uh, adapting to the new normal, is, is very critical because uh, a lot of the things we carry forward are steeped in the traditions. And many countries and state parties would like to adhere to the written document. And that document does not address the problems of today. However, having said that, there's need for us to realize that we need to take the agenda forward and we need to engage globally and we need to adapt to the new way of doing things. And therefore, areas like uh, rules of procedure, uh, silence procedure, engagement through uh, platforms like this one become a new normal. And therefore, perhaps organization need to re-examine uh, the rules of procedure so that they can accommodate technology and eventualities like the ones we find ourselves in. I think um, to do so, countries must, uh, you know, exercise flexibility. Member states must have flexibility, must be pragmatic uh, to, to face the reality of today and um, avoid um, following the traditions in order to delay decisions or to position the, 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 the world into a particular position. And therefore, giving an example of the BWC, we have seen uh, in the last four months, the decisions we have made through silence procedure and engagement and urging member states to exercise flexibility and to accept that we can have virtual meeting of experts has been a challenge, but eventually persuasion has, to, has been accepted that we need to have this hybrid or to accept that we might not have physical meetings. And therefore, uh, as we move forward as a convention, we want to see how looking forward, we can accommodate some of these um, uh, aspects of technology to drive our agenda in, in, in the future for many reasons, some of which have existed, but we have ignored. We have seen um, uh, delegations not attending meetings but they could be a hybrid mechanism. Therefore, there are many lessons to draw from this, but the key one is we can no longer uh, afford to work in silos. You raise the issue of biosecurity and biosafety. We have seen the nexus between uh, international security and uh, public health, and this is very clear to us. And there are many other, um, other um, uh, examples to draw from. And therefore, when within the BWC, we support countries to build capacity for containment of some of the, um, uh, some of the products or um, 
biological products which can, can lead to an, a, a, an event like the one we have, then it becomes real to countries to be able to, to apply themselves to ensure that safety is, is available. Therefore, now we are moving into that arena where we have so much multiplicity of laboratories, scientific institutions, research institutions, which need to be brought to these discussions so that they can appreciate the, the, the necessity of having the framework for safety and the, the framework which is acceptable internationally in doing their research or whatever they are supposed to do in their countries. Therefore, in this dark cloud of COVID-19, I believe we will find some lessons we can take forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Malu. And I'm, I'm really glad that you made this point about the convergence between biosafety and biosecurity, because it's not only in the space of biosafety. We think about cybersecurity and cyber safety. We think about space security and space safety and COPUS and PAROS and those communities coming together. So I think it's a further reflection that this is not limited alone to life sciences or to the area of biotechnology and biological developments. But what it is showing us is that perhaps this is an opportunity for the bio community and the biotech community to lead the way on these discussions uh, in this moment of a public health crisis. Izumi, last word to you, if there's any points you would like to wrap up with. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Renata. Um, the point just you just made uh, was uh, something that I also wanted to um, mention, but um, um, I also absolutely want to support the call for support, um, the, the call by Ambassador Mailu for more flexibility and pragmatism. I think that is absolutely necessary in the multilateralism today. Um, of course, there are me you know, reasons why we have formal processes, but there are also very strong need for better flexible flexibility and, and pragmatism in those processes as well. So I, I definitely do uh, want to second that. Uh, and, and in that connection, I think um, now is the time also to for us to, to really think about creating useful, informal, but substantive platforms and, and processes where different stakeholders can come and, and brainstorm and generate new ideas and new approaches. You know, in 2006, I, I learned um, that in 2006, the late Secretary General Kofi Annan called for a, a creation of a forum to bring together major uh, biotech stakeholders, including industry, um, and of course, the scientific community, civil society and governments into a common program uh, aimed at uh, ensuring that biotechnology advances are not used for terrorists for other criminal purposes. And something like that, I think um, this is uh, informal platforms, but very substantive. Uh, and with the leadership, what we need is the political will and, and the leadership and, and the few actors who can actually, uh, you know, insert energy, uh, intellectual energy um, and, and um, those things into that sort of initiatives. Uh, and I'm, um, I'm really uh, impressed by the, the quality of conversation uh, with leaders like uh, those on the panel, um, you know, participating in the intergovernmental processes. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, we will be able to, I'm sure we will be able to uh, produce new ideas and substantive ideas that is so needed um, in, in the 21st century. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you, Renata. Uh, it's been very stimulating, very interesting. Um, um, again, um, I think this is exactly the kinds of things, the conversations and discussions that we need to have today in the disarmament community. Thank you, Azumi. And let me thank all three panelists for being so, um, I, th I was struck by how open you were to new ideas. You're all, uh, you're, two of you are formal diplomats, one of you is a UN bureaucrat, but how you're thinking so much about the democratization, the equity, the access, the willingness to try new things and new engagements. Uh, and in a way, Izumi, uh, you talked about platforms and the need for more informal platforms. You talked also is about networks. This sort of unity or innovations dialogue is exactly that. We try to bring together communities once a year that don't usually sit together in the same room. 
we try to find accessible ways for new technologies in particular areas to be shared with a broader multilateral uh, community. Um, and so facilitating those conversations. And what I do want to underscore is, I don't think we should underestimate how difficult and challenging that can be. Everything from the complexity of the science and tech to the language that we all use uh, in our technical languages, to the formal or the informal ways we're used to working, uh, and to the conversations that we need to find ways to have. So I think we see this exercise, this annual innovations dialogue, as an attempt to have that dialogue to really create strange bedfellows and through strange bedfellows spend some time learning and understanding each other's perspectives that can then provide the basis for these uh, further discussions in perhaps more formal or, or less formal scenarios. So I very much uh, welcome you and thank you for being such good supports, uh, supporters and sports in, in engaging with us. And I do want to perhaps just in wrapping up say, where we learn so much, I think, from the communities is, Izumi, you talked about leadership, but over the last couple of days, and of course, in the course of the preparing for this dialogue, what has really been impressive for me is just seeing how many uh, scientists, how many experts, how many private sector actors are interested and willing and want to engage in the governance discussions. And so I think in some ways, it's less even about needing the political leadership from states, but the political tolerance of, of some key, of some of the more formal states, uh, international organizations, just as much as national governance, governments, to open that space and facilitate those conversations. And I do think that there is really very, very interesting opportunities and discussions there. So yes, political will, but also political tolerance and perhaps willingness to open up and for all of us to be challenged in, in, in new ways. When we as UNIDIR challenge ourselves in new ways, this was quite an exercise for us to undertake, both in new areas, as we have not had a standalone life sciences program, uh, program at this point, but also because of the current COVID crisis. So I'm going to wrap up by saying, usually I thank all the panelists, which I hope I've done sufficiently, thank all the participants in our conversations, those who presented really excellent and fascinating discussions, but also from, from the, those of you who've listened in and joined. But I really want to give a special shout out to the team here at Unidir. We have a, a number of people who've, who've really cross-collaborated fantastically, uh, particularly James Revel from the uh, WMD team and our resident bio and chem expert, together with Giacomo Percy Pauli uh, from the SecTech, and above all, and a special shout out to Alicia Anand, our fantastic young uh, focal point for this work. Special shout out to Letitia Zarkin, our producer, who has been, who is our space uh, person, so a good example of, of safety and security and produce, uh, also in the hosting of these online events. And let me just say, please do give us your feedback. Uh, it's online, easily accessed. You've got the, the, the Q mark there. We would love to hear from you and join us next year for another innovations dialogue, trying to bring together new communities with disarmament communities for looking ahead in a safe way, uh, safety and security. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, it's my pleasure and I wish to, to have been here today and I wish you all the very best for a, a very happy, safe uh, next few days and weekend wherever you are around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Bye bye.